Welcome, everyone. It's so great to see friends and alumni, and it's just great to see so many people turn out today. Um, this is our seventh annual Pline Research Symposium, and it's wonderful, again, to be able to be back in person. This is the first time we've had our full program since um, before COVID. My name is Shelley Gray. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmacy, and I'm also the director of the Pline Center for Geriatric Pharmacy. Yes. Hey, what would it be with a program without a technical difficulty? Okay, before we get started, I want to take we want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Pine leadership um, to celebrate Patricia Hadley, who retired from our department about a month ago. She provided support for the Pline Certificate for as long as I can remember, and she holds a special place in our hearts. We greatly appreciate her enthusiasm and dedication over the years, and she has already missed. And we have set up a fund in Patricia's honor to fulfill her wish to support students who are pursuing the certificate in geriatric pharmacy. Details will, will be provided after this event for those who are interested in helping us reach our goal of $100,000. So on with the program. Um, so again, I'm very thankful that we were able to co-sponsor this event with the UW Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And kind of the, the lay of the land is that we're gonna have our keynote speaker with time for about 10 to 15 minutes for questions that will lead directly into our panel discussion. And we have a special guest um, for that. Then we'll have a break and then we'll come back and have three research updates from the Pline Center. And then following that, we will have a reception. And so event of this nature, um, it takes a village really to pull this off, the planning and the implementation. So a special thanks to Sarah Carr and um, Smriti Patel, and also the advancement team at the University of Washington School of Pharmacy. Also, I'd like to thank our day of event support, Jason Williams and um, Marina Gano. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas Grabowski. He is the director of the UW um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And you can see he has multiple, um, wears multiple hats in that arena. And um, in his role as the medical director of the UW Memory and Brain Wellness Center and a behavioral neurologist, Tom leads a provider team that diagnoses, treats, and supports patients living with memory loss or dementia. He has a very long and accomplished CV. And he mentioned to me, after this gig is over, he's going to pursue nature photography. So with no further, no further ado, I'd like to please welcome Dr. Thomas Grabowski. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you, Shelley, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an honor to be here. I, I appreciate being invited. Um, let me just um, say, first of all, I don't have any conflict of interest to declare on this. I'm going to talk a lot about treatment of Alzheimer's disease, but I haven't been an investigator or have any financial interest in any of the companies that are doing these clinical trials. Um, and um, well, we're not getting any younger. Uh, you know, in the, the purple strata there on the top is over the, over the coming decades, the proportion of the population 85 years and older is just growing. Um, and, you know, we're making progress on cancer, we're making progress on heart disease, and we're not making as much progress on Alzheimer's disease. And so that's, in a way, the biomedical challenge of our time, I would say. Um, but I'm here today to talk a little bit about recent developments that move at least one step in a positive direction, and to talk a little bit about how that's changing clinical care at University of Washington. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about a little. There's going to be a little bit of background. I'm going to spend some time on biomarkers because really this story, in a way, is also about biomarkers, the way that we the things that we can measure and use to track disease processes and measure the impact of treatment. And then we'll spend the bulk of the time, see if I have, can you see the pointer No. Let's try this. See the laser pointer, there we go. Um, talk about amyloid clearing immunotherapy, which is uh, in the news and on our minds a lot. And we've had a lot of recent experience with that. Um, and I'll speculate a little bit about what's gonna happen down the line. So let's start with um, the beginning. Um, and that is, that's really important. And I start, always start here, keep it straight. Your two levels of diagnosis, what's the matter with memory and thinking and what's the matter with the brain to explain that, what you would see if you could look under the microscope. Okay. And on the memory and thinking stratum, you know, a lot of, a lot of, it's sort of part of normal aging that you have some subjective concern about memory, word retrieval and so forth. But at some point, you know, a cognitive test can demonstrate that there's an objective impairment relative to your peers, and and yet you're still independent. And that's what we call mild cognitive impairment. And then, you you know, if you become dependent to some degree on others, we start to use the term dementia. That's really what we mean. Um, and I just think it's important to keep straight um, that, that the cognitive level diagnosis is not the same as the sort of etiologic level. On the etiologic level or causal level, we're talking about um, Alzheimer's disease today. And what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is what you, it, it's, a, it's a degenerative condition and it's marked by this distinctive microscopic appearance. Um, and you see two features. You see these um, big plaques that are composed of amyloid beta protein. And you can see this plaque is surrounded by a, kind of a reaction, a cellular reaction. And then you see a second thing, these little flame-shaped intracellular inclusions that are called neurofibrillary tangles that are made of a different protein called tau. When you see those two features under the microscope, you're seeing a process of Alzheimer's disease, which may or may not have a clinical manifestation of dementia, okay? Yet, most likely. Um, and we've learned that the that the tangle pathology in particular closely tracks um, the progression, the clinical progression of the disease. And we've got this divided into six sort of pathological stages we call Brock stages, one through six. Um, and we, in a general sort of map the clinical part onto it like this, where you have a, um, have, you know, Alzheimer's dementia, which might be an eight or 10 year course of disease preceded by a period that may be five years or so uh, that we call mild cognitive impairment and preceded by some 15 years, maybe more of normal functioning, but with a latent disease process happening. Um, does that all make sense? And it's not quite that simple. It looks more like this really. Um, it's kind of a slanted relationship where where MCI can happen earlier if there's some sort of comorbid condition happening. And it's also possible to lean in and function better despite a certain burden pathology, what we call resilience to Alzheimer's disease and a major focus of our research interest right now. It has something to do with a better, stronger physiology of the brain that results from lifestyle factors like how, edu how much education you have, what your cognitive lifestyle is like, et cetera. Important biological clue is probably hiding in there somewhere. So um, so for today's talk, we're gonna talk about Alzheimer's disease as this pathologic entity, this biological entity, and the cognitive impairment <laughs> as the clinical sort of endpoint or manifestation of it. So let's talk a little bit about biomarkers. And uh, We've talked about amyloid and tau and plaques and tangles already. There's three ways you can think about these things. First way we've already mentioned, which is the hallmarks of the disease. If you have that under the microscope, that's what we call the disease. Degeneration with plaques and tangles is Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, but we also take advantage of understanding what are the protein components of those plaques and tangles to develop and use biomarkers, things we can measure in body fluids like, like spinal fluid or more recently in blood plasma or things we can see on brain scans that uh, detect and measure Alzheimer's disease. So it's no longer true that you can only make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease after the fact. We make this disease with a high degree of certainty in our patients using these biomarker tests. Um, and we'll come a little bit later to, the, to what these might have to do with the actual biology of the disease. And in the research realm, we've been using something we call the ATN framework. Uh, and ATN stands for A amyloid, T tau, and N neurodegeneration. And we have biomarkers for all three aspects of the disease, as I mentioned. And we'll get into those details a little bit. But you can put everybody somewhere on this ATN framework. You know, I might be A, a plus for amyloid positive, but tau negative and neurodegeneration negative. Or you may be negative on all three, or you may be positive on all three. And when people have in the research clinic now, when people have a positive amyloid marker, one of these A plus combinations, we say they're on the Alzheimer disease continuum. And as soon as they have a positive tau marker, in addition, that's Alzheimer's disease will stop. And, and I didn't notice I didn't say anything yet about cognition. Okay, so in the research definition is biological. Um, and we use, I'm going to talk a lot about amyloid today, so I'm going to talk about the amyloid markers. And one of the important markers is the, is the burden of amyloid on a PET scan, on a so-called amyloid PET scan. And we have three or four, we have three commercially available tracers and one research available tracer that um, can be used to basically home in on amyloid protein in the brain in a way that we can make an image in a PET scanner. And we can put all of, we can quantitate those with things called standardized uptake value ratios or SUVERs. And we can convert those for each tracer into a common language that we call the centiloid scale. And, and we'll talk, we'll use that number a little bit today, but hundred centiloids basically means, you know, it's a like percent amyloid, if you will, centiloid. Uh, 100 centiloids is the average value that somebody with Alzheimer's disease will have on their PET scan. And we think that it takes about 20 centiloids burden to start to show up as positive on an amyloid scan. And below 20 centiloids, we say you have a negative scan. And we also know that people who have a burden that low don't accumulate more amyloid over time. So that's the goal is 20 centiloids of amyloid or better. All right. Oh. Uh, so, so here's what an amyloid PET scan looks like. This is a normal amyloid PET scan. You see a slice of the brain this way. On the bottom is an MRI, and on the top is the PET scan. And the PET scan, in a normal situation, look should be, pretty much be a photographic negative of the MRI scan. Okay, That's what it should look like. You should be able to see the gray and the white matter distinctly, or relatively distinctly, in the scan. And here's an amyloid PET scan that's positive, and you can see you lose that granularity, the, the difference between the gray and the white matter, it all blurs together like a, almost like ground glass. And that's a positive amyloid scan. And it's interesting when someone appears in the clinic with the earliest cognitive stages of Alzheimer's disease, it's not a close call. That, that scan is maximally abnormal already because it has been for 10 years, okay? Um, uh, so that's why it's such a useful test. It's, you know, with an amyloid scan, you can say with pretty strong confidence, yes or no, is Alzheimer's disease happening here? Um, so that's the amyloid PET scan. Um, when it's positive, you have a moderate density of amyloid plaques in the brain. It always looks about the same through the brain. It doesn't vary that much from person to person. It leads symptoms. So it, what, what it turns out to be useful for is to certify diagnosis. We can also do the same with spinal fluid. We can, we can measure the, the parameters in the spinal fluid, and they're, in, if anything, a little more sensitive. Uh, so that's good. And while we've waited for Medicare to start paying for amyloid scans, we've been using spinal fluid quite a bit. Um, 
We also have another kind of scan called a tau PET scan. This is a scan that traces those neurofibrillary tangles in the brain, which bear a pretty close relationship to the stage of the disease. So far, these are not um, a clinical test. Um, that may change in the in the future, and I'll talk about that. Um, and in the research realm, we use this basically to detect the extent of the disease and to track progress. Okay. So um, here's two curves. The red curve is the portion of people in the population who have dementia at any given age. You can see that's kind of an exponentially increasing curve. The blue curve is the curve for amyloid positivity in all commerce, which basically is also exponential and shifted 15 years earlier, okay? The reason I'm showing this is just to give you some quantitative sense of how common this is, because if you take now, uh, see if I have it, oops, not there. If you look at the 70 year mark here and take that vertical and read out 20 to 25% of individuals at age 70 will have a positive amyloid scan. And we think are on the way in some period of time zero to 15 years, you know, to having some cognitive impairment. So, so you know, in a, in a way, the, this dementia, which is what everybody thinks about with Alzheimer's disease is really the tip of the iceberg. There, for everybody with dementia, there's at least a couple or three people with a preclinical stage of disease, either mild cognitive impairment or truly presymptomatic preclinical disease. And the only other thing I wanna say about the sort of lab tests and markers here is, to comment on, on APO, lipoprotein E or APOE. So APOE is a cholesterol carrying protein in the brain that, or in the, in the human being that um, is, should I click on that? Or, or there's a, somebody once in the waiting room. Um, is a cholesterol carrying protein in the gene that encodes it is, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It, besides age, you know, it is one of the strongest risk factors we know, uh, and it comes in three flavors, um, E2, E3, and E4, where E4 is the, is the problem, is the problem allele, which is in about 14% of the population. But the way it works out that for people who come in with Alzheimer's disease, at least half are E4 positive because it, it, they're enriched in this. Um, and if you look at these curves, this is the rate of amyloid positivity with age as a function of your APOE genotype. So the E4 carriers are right here. Um, and if you don't have E4, your, your chance of developing this amyloidosis is significantly lower. So this is like, like a factor of four lower. And if you're one of the unfortunate people that has E4 homozygous state, then your risk is about 16, 14 or 16 fold higher. Um, so I can, so, um, so these biomarker tests, they track Pathologic amyloid and tau proteins and amyloid positivity is a key discriminator of Alzheimer's disease for other causes of memory loss and dementia. And they're, they're hard to access in practice, but are they're, they're key for selecting patients for amyloid clearing therapy, as we'll talk about. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Um, so let's talk about amyloid. Um, what's amyloid have to do with the disease itself? So I told you there's three ways to think about amyloid and tau. And the third way is you know, as parts of the biology actually driving the disease. So this has been very controversial. Um, you'll hear about uh, the amyloid cascade theory or the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. I'm gonna touch a little bit on that today, um, uh, and you'll, but, but, in a, but in a focused way. So the amyloid precursor protein is uh, on chromosome 21. Uh, mutations there cause early onset Alzheimer disease, that is before age 65. Um, and just one extra copy of APP is enough to put you in the category of having early Alzheimer's disease. And we see that all the time in Down syndrome. Remember that's three copies of chromosome 21. So Down patients um, mostly develop early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there are these rare families in the world where the only problem is duplication of that gene and they all develop early onset disease. So it's enough It's a, It's enough to do it. It's not the only thing that drives Alzheimer's disease, don't get me wrong, but, but Alzheimer's is certainly, or uh, amyloid is certainly relevant. Um, it's a product of synaptic activity. You're making it all the time. Sorry to say we have no idea why we make it. We do not know the role 
of amyloid protein in normal functioning. In some way, it seems to be important for important trophic factor in the brain. Uh, it has something to do with synapses, maintaining synapses. In brain bulk, if you make a, an amyloid null mouse, um, they have they develop, but they don't. They have smaller brains, and they they're not quite right. Um, but we really don't know what it does. All we really know is that there's this one fragment. It's complicated chemistry of chopping it into various pieces. There's this one fragment called amyloid beta, one to forty-two residues, one to forty-two. That um, it's very sticky. It 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 sticks to itself, um, and it starts to accumulate if it's overproduced and cause the accumulation of, of amyloid plaques, okay? So we know a lot about this one aspect of, of amyloid protein. We don't really know why we have it in the first place. Um, and the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease sort of posits that there are, that this amyloid beta as it accumulates is toxic in some way to the brain, okay? Either in its, either in its free-floating soluble monomer form or or else you know in bulk in the in the plaques and if you look at an amyloid plaque i didn't constantly i didn't call your attention to this in the photograph earlier if you look in the surround of the plaque you see uh inflammation you see what are called activated microglia which are the brain's version of inflammation and you see all these neurites that are kind of dying back you know like the wicked witch of the west's feet coming dying back you know and and and, and you just have the feeling looking at that yeah there's something wrong in the surround of that plaque, uh, but it's been surprisingly hard to track that, the actual biology of that down. Um, and so in the amyloid hypothesis, this APP aggregates in either the plaque or the soluble factors cause a cascade of problems in the brain. Um, and you can see uh, there's so many problems, synaptic dysfunction, hyperexcitability, altered cell signaling, microglial activation, and so many downstream consequences of this that there's so much that we really don't know anything, right? The, the, all these factors, it's a little bit like um, like murder on the Orient Express. There's all these suspects. They all know each other, you know, and you touch one of them and they all kind of react. Uh, but, but we don't really know which of these is key, okay? There is something about this which is causing damage though. And we know that if you don't have amyloid around, the abnormal tau protein never gets out of the initial spots where it appears in the, in the medial temporal lobe. It never gets out into the neocortex unless you also have amyloid pathology accumulating. So in some sense, the tau pathology, at least in the cortex, is a downstream event after the amyloid happens. So I like to think of it as the amyloid is the insult and tau sort of traces the impact of the disease after some years go by after some latency, after some threshold is hit, maybe that 20 semiloid threshold. So that's all background to help understand what we're gonna do with amyloid clearing immunotherapy. Oh, and I just have a little commercial here. It's not all about amyloid, I know. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at all the genetic evidence, there's evidence that neuroinflammation plays a role. There's inf if, you, if you tweak just the protein trafficking machinery, there's there's problems, cholesterol metabolism is important. Um, tau, the tau cascade itself is important. And I'm not gonna talk about any of that today, but, but we really shouldn't expect that interrupting the amyloid process is gonna take care of all Alzheimer's disease. Just saying. Um, so, so here's the thing, you know, amyloid uh, clinical trials with agents working against amyloid have been really on the whole really disappointing, okay? Um, there's a whole list of them there since, I don't know, 20, I can't read that, 2003, 2004, something like that. Um, and these, you know, we've tried uh, targeting the, the secretases, the proteases that chop up amyloid, the gamma secretase and the beta secretase. Uh, we've tried um, monoclonal antibodies of various stripes to, uh, and, um, and even vaccines, okay? Um, and all of this, all of these things have been basically negative, except until, except and until the recent amyloid clearing antibodies have been introduced. And the reason that we know that these are behaving differently has a lot to do with the biomarkers that I, I told you about a minute ago. So yeah, so here we are talking about anti amyloid therapy and how did we get here? And I'm going to take you just really briefly back to 
1999, when someone had the idea that you could immunize the mice, the Alzheimer's mice against Alzheimer's disease. And we immunized them against A beta. And there is this beautiful result. This is an untreated mouse, all this amyloid plaque in the hippocampus. Here's the treated, the, the immunized mouse, no amyloid accumulated. Um, this looked like a fantastic thing to do and it got rushed into human trials. And the human trial was did not go well. Um, um, uh, a, a fair percentage of the immunized group developed inflammation in the brain and the blood vessels. Um, and you can see that inflammation in these uh, MRI scans here. The white, white areas on the flare image are areas of edema or, or, or infiltration of fluid. And you will also see micro hemorrhages, small, small hemorrhages in the brain where small blood vessels have burst. Um, and when you know a couple of these people passed away and the autopsies show this sort of vascular centered inflammatory response. So back to the drawing board. Um, and so the, what the field did was, was try a passive immunization strategy instead of this active immunization strategy. And that's where the monoclonal antibodies came from. And first thing here is we've started to invent things that not even we can pronounce. Um, uh, all sorts of MABs, you know, that are directed against various um, amyloid targets. And um, it's become clear they sort of sort into kind of two groups, those which are uh, where the antibody is glomming onto monomers of amyloid and those which is more specific for the fibers like the, like the polymers and the, and the plaque uh, substance itself. And it turns out the action is on these latter category because these are the only ones that have been shown to actually clear amyloid out of the brain. Uh, and um, these are the, not, not the epinizumab, but the, these four are all amyloid clearing. And you can see in the red box are how many centiloids of reduction these trials showed, you know, 40, 60, 70 centiloids reduction of amyloid burden in the brain. And on the right, you see images that were taken, that were published in Nature uh, uh, showing that aducanumab could clear amyloid out of the brain in a dose dependent fashion. So we can definitely get the amyloid out of the brain with these antibodies. Um, and the kind of notion is, this is kind of an idealized diagram, but the notion is with treatment, you can make this amyloid burden plunge below threshold, below that 20 centiloid threshold, and that your clinical course then in sort of a lead lag relationship will then go better without as much quote toxic amyloid around and you should separate from the untreated group. Okay, that's the idea. Um, and to some extent, that's what we're seeing. Um, I think I said all that. Um, and then the other thing you need to know is that to understand what comes next is that amyloid doesn't only accumulate in the brain substance, it also accumulates in the small blood vessel walls in the brain, okay? So here is a photomicrograph, you see all kinds of kind of a galaxy of plaques, and then this is a vessel here in the middle, and you can see the, the wall of the vessel is staining with the amyloid stain. And so what happens is these amyloid clearing agents are gonna go pull the amyloid out of the vessel walls too. Um, and they're also gonna start to, to um, dissolve the clots and or the plaques and the amyloid um, fragments are going to want to drain out through the vessels. And so you're going to have suddenly uh, a lot of instability in the vessel wall. And so you can get either just mecha for mechanical reasons, leakage of fluid out, or you can actually get some inflammation, very reminiscent of the inflammation in the, in the immunized mice that sets up as well. In fact, it seems to be Amyloid clearing and these amyloid related small vessel problems seem to be two sides of the same coin. Um, and so you get these effects that we've that we call aria, terrible acronym, but it's better than saying amyloid related imaging abnormalities all the time. Um, and it comes in two flavors, aria E for edema and aria H for hemosiderin or hemorrhage. Okay, so you get uh, fluid extravasation shows up as this bright signal on a flare image and fluid and a, a blood product accumulation in just in the surround of that small vessel. 
that shows up as a dephased kind of hole on a, on, on a particular MRI sequence. Um, it's a microscopic amount of blood. You might not even see it if you look, go looking for it, but it distorts the magnetic field enough that we can detect it in MRI. Um, so, so it turns out that the, the game of amyloid clearing immunotherapy is to balance you know, penetration into the brain and rapid clearance of amyloid with this aria side effect that can happen. So that may, brings me specifically to lecanemab. Um, and this is one of those amyloid clearing agents. It's made by ASI. Um, for what it's worth, you know, this was this was raised to um, amyloid fibers from uh, patients who had the Arctic, Arctic mutation, which is a particularly amyloid amyloidogenic version of uh, of A beta. Um, in a phase two study, uh, found that you know, a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram could give you 75 or 70 or 75 centiloids of reduction of amyloid burden. So that's what was put into the phase three trial that that um, I wanna talk about. And I'm gonna skip that slide. So, so the phase three trial was published in the New England Journal. This is uh, Clarity AD. Um, and the this study, involved like 1,700 people. I uh, just kind of summarized the, the characteristics here in red. Um, mostly white, um, mostly mildly impaired. So 60% had mild cognitive impairment. 80% had the CDR stage 0 0.5. So CDR, the clinical dementia rating scale, sort of the gold standard for grading severity of dementia. So so even the ones that, were, that had dementia were mi very mildly impaired. Um, so you would say for MCI and very mild Alzheimer's dementia with a positive amyloid marker. And you can see here the rates of the different APOE genotypes, as I promised, you know, more than half have an E4 allele. I think if you add the E3, E4s and the E4 homozygotes, there's 68% there. Um, and on average, you had 75 centiloids of amyloid burden. So they come in, they get lecanemab every two weeks for 18 months with a protocol to, of serial MRI scans to monitor for ARIA. And the outcomes look like this, where the primary outcome on top is what happens to the CDR sum of boxes, which is the gold standard sort of dementia measurement scale. And the placebo curve is in blue and the lecanemab curve is in orange, and you can see the separation there at 18 months, which is modest, okay? It's significant, but, you know, on average, there were like three boxes of impairment, and then you made about half a box difference in the, in the end here. And there's argument about how clinically important or observable that difference is. Um, on the bottom half here, you have the secondary outcomes. On the left is the reduction in amyloid burden, which you can see is dramatic. No reduction at all in the placebo group, but very dramatic in the lecanemab group. Um, and then some of the other cognitive tests that were kind of used as secondary measures. This one on the right specifically tailored, specifically developed to measure change in people with mild cognitive impairment, which I think in a way is really the right way, would have been the right way to measure this study in the first place, because the CDR, CDR is a more, uh, measures greater degrees of impairment, if you will. Um, so, kind of hard to argue, the primary endpoint and all the secondary endpoints are significant. So that's why that's why lecanemab has our attention sort of nationally at this point. Um, in terms of the adverse events, you can kind of see here, I yellow highlighted the rates of aria, which are the main thing to worry about. And you can see this is, uh, you know, 17% rate of aria age. 13% rate of ARIA-E, maybe overall somewhere around 20%, 20, low 20s, because a lot of people have both. Um, uh, uh, and then this bears a very strong relationship to the APOE genotype. So if you happen to have no E4 alleles, your ARIA-E rate is only 5%. If you have one, it's 11%. If you have both, it's 33%. So you know we, we've never in the clinic 
measured people's APOE genotypes for clinical purposes. It's always been a research question. It's not been actionable, but now it really factors into what we tell people about their risk for taking this medication. Um, so then, and this wasn't really part of the original aim, but if you look at what happens to the tau markers, remember I said these are downstream, they're getting better. Um, they're getting significantly better, no matter which tau species we're measuring, which which is what got my attention for for like analysis. So we're not just you know making things cosmetically better; uh, the biology is improving here. Um, and then there's another biomarker test here, which is uh, called GFAP, which is a measure of um, activation of the astrocytes. It's a measure of inflammation in the brain, and it's also improved as a, as a consequence of treatment. So that's the basic data, a modest improvement in the clinical trajectory, but un unambiguously in the positive direction, um, and a lot of effect on the biology. Um, when you get into the weeds of the secondary endpoints, there's a lot of noise. Um, and um, the main take home point here is makes us worry a bit about these homozygotes, whether they're really benefiting, how much they're really benefiting from this. Although if you look at the other, this is for the primary endpoint. If you look at some of the sec other secondary endpoints, it's in, in favor of treatment. But this is, I think, uh, where there's clinical, a lot of clinical disagreement, should we be treating people who are E4 homozygotes? And then the other thing to be concerned about is, and we don't know the reason for this, but all of the anti-amyloid agents are tending to result in reduced brain volumes, okay? I didn't say atrophy because I don't know why it would be atrophying uh, and that's got a bad connotation, but it looks like that, right? So there's less brain volume and it's, um, you know, it's, it's specifically for the clearing age, amyloid clearing agents. And there was the same thing was the case in the immunized mice, by the way, they also reduced their brain volumes. There's something about this um, that we don't understand yet. So that's a big asterisk on the whole thing. Yeah, so the question is, could that, could that reflect reduction in inflammation? That is one of the things people are wondering. It's a good hypothesis, but so far there's not good data for that. Yeah, <laughs> that, would be the, that would be good. <laughs> um, Okay, and so and so now I want to just shift gears real fast and talk to talk about the other agent, which is um, had a recently completed phase three trial, which is favorable, which is donanimab, another one of the amyloid clearing agents. Um, I won't go through all this, just to say that that the the difference, the different thing about this trial was that they didn't um, they didn't only uh, rely on the sort of clinical endpoints like this. They also looked at biomarkers um, in terms of like how to know when to stop treating with denanumab. So at baseline patients or participants rather got an amyloid scan and a tau PET scan. They only, and they kept track of like how they did, those who had a lower burden of tau, those who had already had a higher burden of tau. Um, and uh, every, um, few months, they would do another amyloid scan and see how much reduction in amyloid burden there was. So if, if you got um, uh, if you got down to less than 24 centiloids, they just stopped treating, okay? And they put you in with the placebo group for the rest of the trial, all right? So here it is. This is really testing the idea that if you get amyloid to a certain level, that, that's, that you're in remission, if you will, from your Alzheimer, from your amyloid component of your Alzheimer disease. All right, so again, the outcomes look pretty good. On the left, you have um, in, the, in the low and um, intermediate tau burden folks, and on the right, the combined analysis. In this paper, they never show you the results from the high burden tau people, and the, reason, the answer, reason for that is they didn't show that much benefit. Okay, so that's about one third of the study population had high tau burden and weren't showing a lot of benefit, something that's important. Um, and then the biomarker effects are also pretty much the same, dramatic clearance of amyloid and positive effects on tau markers. Um, 
actually these studies are remarkably concordant this way. Um, you know, describing a moderate degree of benefit, you know, and how do you describe this to patient? Well, you probably don't say percent slowing on primary measures, but, um, you know, 25 to 30% slower progression. You can, you can um, express that as um, uh, like how many months you save over the 18, over an 18 month study. I think I have a I have a figure here to explain what I mean by that. So if you look at the lecanemab, where the placebo group gets at a year, it takes the lecanemab group 17 months to get to that spot. So you could say they save five months over that 18 months. That's intuitive to patients. They understand that kind of language. But you get an idea um, from these studies that these numbers are pretty close for donanumab and lecanemab. Okay, so how does this affect what we do in the clinic? Um, so, so we were fortunate that GW Medicine, the Neurosciences Institute, gave us a project manager and 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 some privileged access to the Epic team, and and over six months or so, we were able to to really put together a kind of coherent program that guarded people's safety as we sort of rolled out this treatment. Um, Mike Rosenblum was, uh, is my colleague, was um, instrumental in spearheading this uh, initiative. Um, we're hewing very closely to the uh, criteria for eligibility in the Clarity AD trial, the leclanumab trial. So, you know, patients who are have MCI or very mild dementia, which I think connotes that they're able to make their own decision for this treatment. Um, who have amyloid positivity, and there's some exclusion things, and we can't give this to someone who's anticoagulated for the obvious reason that we don't want their microhemorrhages to turn into macrohemorrhages. Um, we can't, we, if there are other severe health problems that are affecting their prognosis, probably not a good idea. Uh, they have to have a baseline uh, high quality MRI scan. We've had to redo a number of these um, to make sure that we have a good baseline to follow, to track ARIA. Uh, and then we have, a, we actually have a lecanemab board. This is a little sort of modeled on a tumor board where we meet once a month and uh, get the stroke docs and the radiologists and neurologists and neuropsychologists in the same room and kind of encourage uniformity of application of these criteria um, and develop a culture of like, like who seems to be the best candidate and who may who may be able to bend the rules in an edge case and who may be where should we hold the line? That's been working pretty well. And you know, we 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 have a series of visits and we culminate in a documented discussion of benefit and risk for this treatment. And you know, it turns out to be maybe 15% of our clientele are eligible for this. Uh, it's really a very select population. And the patient journey looks something like that. The blue boxes across the timeline are visits. And then there's a bunch of tests. There's your, there's your amyloid marker test. There's your APOE genotype. There's lecanemab board and risk benefit discussion. And then finally an infusion therapy plan. And then all these infusions over 18 months. Okay. And the red, the red slices are the sort of front loaded MRI surveillance MRI scans for ARIA. Um, this turns out to be very much a case by case decision. You know, I've talked about all the medical factors so far that help us decide who's eligible, but this the patient has a lot to say about this. Um, you know, how they weigh that potential benefit and that risk. Um, what their what their insurance carriers are going to do for them on this. Medicare is covering, but um, the Medicare Advantage plans, you know, have various uh, wrinkles to them, and people who are affected before age 65 who aren't Medicare beneficiaries yet are another case. Uh, ASI also gets involved with some patient assistance. So, so that turns out to be a significant factor. And then how easy or hard it is for them to get to our infusion center, because we're not just letting this happen in the community. Uh, we're not letting them have their MRIs or their infusions in the community. We, we want them to be done here just because we think this has got a narrow therapeutic index and we wanna make sure that we do this safely. We have kicked off 
think first infusion December 1st. And I think we have about 20 actively infusing and maybe another 60 in the pipeline, uh, various stages of adjudication and waiting for coverage and workup. And that's probably a little more that we, we thought we were gonna have about 60 a year based on sort of a self like a self audit of what our clientele looked like over the previous year. And I think we're gonna actually have more than that. Mike's nodding. Um, it's pretty disruptive to our, the you know, was to what was our status quo. These are a bunch of things that we, there's a bunch of things we never did before. We didn't do routine biomarker testing in MCI. Uh, we didn't have to reconcile biomarker, discrepant biomarker data, which comes up. Uh, we didn't have to do APOE genotyping people or can coordinate infusions with MRI scans. Um, and I mentioned our lecanemab board. So, so it's, it's resulted in a more um, medical feel <laughs> to our clinic, I would say. Um, and, uh, and it's been also nice to have um, something to offer for this particular segment of our clientele. And you'll hear, you'll hear from one of our, I'm waving at Andrea back there, you'll hear, hear from someone in a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, if you, if you turn back the clock to when I got involved in this field in 1990 or so, um, here's our timeline, the cognitive timeline, right? Late MCI dementia. This is when we were making diagnosis back then. People were arriving in the clinic moderately to severely demented. Um, nobody even knew about MCI. MCI wasn't a thing at that time. Um, and we had some symptom some of the symptomatic medicines we have now, Dinepazil, you know, was recently on the market. So we had that. Um, now we're seeing at least 25 or 30 percent of our patients in memory and brain arrive with it, you know, at the stage of mild cognitive impairment, some with no documented impairment and some still with dementia. But we're making diagnosis much earlier. And we have a lot of non-pharmacologic approaches that we've been using. Um, you know, optimizing vascular health, optimizing other lifestyle factors that build this resilience in, into the brain, um, uh, even have a sort of two-week mind and body wellness boot camp for people with mild cognitive impairment that helps jumpstart some of that. Um, and, and even for people that have some degree of impairment, there's ways we can work around it. So people who have trouble with remembering new material can still learn new habits and skills, and we can exploit that spared capacity to help people develop healthy habits that keep them more independent longer. But on top of all that, um, uh, we're now able to offer this disease-modifying therapy to some of the patients. So that's kind of where we're at in 2024. Our aspiration is diagnosing here, right? And the what we need to know is, you know, will will amyloid clearing therapies or other approaches allow us to intervene before there are symptoms? The, the, that's an open question at this point. There are trials cooking, but we don't know. Um, and so then let me just kind of sum up by saying what some of the uh, open questions are and, and, and what some of the future might look like. So I'd say in summary, there's quite a few reasons to like lecanemab. Um, I mean, it's it was significant on its the primary and all the secondary endpoints. And maybe more to the point, um, the other amyloid clearing treatments have consistent findings. Uh, for aducanumab, emer emergent engaged sort of dissociated, we can talk about that, but, um, but the effect sizes are similar actually. Um, and uh, the, the degree of amyloid clearance is similar and the, and the favorable tau markers is super consistent across all three agents. So I'd say the consistency uh, gives some confidence here, um, and uh, especially the favorable effects on the downstream markers. And then just as a sort of a medical milieu thing, um, I mean, it gives people a reason for an early diagnosis, right? We're gonna, we expect we're gonna see more people understanding they should be looking for attention at the stage of mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna accelerate the commercialization of the blood markers, which are here and used all the time in research now and are basically as good as a spinal fluid marker. Um, so they're ready for prime time, just the right clearance needs to happen. 
um, reasons for caution. Uh, don't forget, decline still happens. This is not a cure, this is medicine. Uh, and it comes with a cost and it comes with side effects and it comes with um, a commitment to the treatment, especially this treatment where you're getting infused you know, for 18 months. Um, we don't really know the long-term effects of ARIA. Uh, we don't really understand the associated brain shrinkage part. Despite those two factors, the trial is positive, so that so they, they, they must not counteract it entirely, but, uh, but we don't really know. Um, and then the final point is that the expense and scalability of this of this approach. Um, my personal feeling is that um, this holds up over time. We're going to revisit the vaccine. I think that's really what's going to happen. Um, um, so expect uh, rapid changes in this field. Um, more, like I say, more diagnosis early more convenient biomarkers, more flexibility in infusion options. I think ultimately we may be doing home infusions for some of this. Um, and, um, and expect us to be able to start using these biomarkers to say when to stop treatment, okay? The plasma markers are here. This is just great, beautiful performance on a plasma amyloid test. You can buy this now from C2N if you want to. Your insurance won't pay, it, pay for you, but, but you can get it done. Um, and then looking out, looking ahead, you know, the hunt is on for the way to mitigate ARIA risk, right? If we could do that, we could probably push this therapy later in the disease process. Um, uh, I mentioned the prevention trials are underway, blood biomarkers, um, and then really no one's explored combining, combining this pharmacotherapy with the non-pharmacologic approaches, whether we could get and sort of a synergistic benefit. So that, I think that's an open research question. Um, and then just to leave you with this thought, so we're gonna slow it down, but everybody's gonna spend more time in these early stages of memory loss and maybe mild dementia. So we're gonna think about the programs to make the community friendly for this. So with that, I get to thank my team. I have the privilege to speak on behalf of this wonderful team at the Memory Brain Wellness Center. A special call out to Mike Rosenblum there on the left and uh, invite your questions. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Can I speak to the, what symptoms the patients have as they're improving through therapy? So, so they probably don't have symptoms of improvement. Um, so, so, um, we're making a diagnosis at a stage where people may have mainly episodic memory impairment, may have trouble with short-term re, you know, recall of new material. Um, if, you know, if we're right about lecanemab, their only side effects are gonna be whether or not they have any infusion reaction, allergic reaction at the time of the infusion, or if they develop ARIA. But even ARIA, almost uh, like the great majority of the time is asymptomatic. We track it down on a scan. Um, so they're, hopefully not having any symptoms. Uh, are they noticing improvement? I don't know. Um, it, it's mild impairment. It usually takes six or 12 months to measure any difference in an untreated patient. So, so it might be hard to tell over that period of time. Yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, sure. Are other centers uh, doing similar work with the similar two agents that you mentioned? Yes. Um, yeah, Mike Rosenblum and I were talking, just a shout out, another shout out to Mike. There's a, um, a throwaway journal, a neurology throwaway journal. It's got a feature article in it this week that mentions our clinic as one of those rolling out lecanemab, but also measures some other clinics. Mike is, Mike is quoted in that article. Um, all of our, all of the ADRCs, have an associated memory clinic, and I would think the I think the great majority are rolling this out. Um, we're probably leading the way. I don't know of another entity in Seattle that's giving this yet. I think I think Providence Swedish is working in that direction. Um, our sister institutions at UCSF and UC Irvine are are giving it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is there a way or are you at a point where you can identify people who are faster amyloid producers or slower, or you could recommend a schedule or uh, for, for biomarker evaluation? Interest, you know, it's an interesting question. So I, I, I looked for it to see if I could pull, put a slide up today. Um, a couple of groups have shown that once the amyloid starts accumulating, it's pretty linear. I mean, you can time shift them back onto one line. It's really interesting. So you could start to think about almost like an amyloid age um, and predict when people are going to start to have trouble. So maybe maybe it will be helpful to do a quantitative scan in the preclinical. Um, uh, but no, it doesn't it doesn't look like there's that much variability. Yeah. The variability in when they start accumulating. It. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating. Um, uh, I just have a question about the insurance because you did mention that insurance can be a pretty big factor in determining uh, treatment for these patients. So do you have a rough sense of what fraction of the patients eligible for the like, captain map uh, at UW might be under age 65 or have uh, commercial insurance? I'm just kind of curious. Well, we're going to see an enriched number of people with early onset just because we're a referral center. Um, so, so in the community, they're pretty unusual, um, in our clinic, in the, our clinic, you know, we, we have some every week. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so that's an insurance kind of dialogue right now. Some of the carriers, some of the, um, private carriers are, are covering and others aren't. Um, and the second part of your question was what, uh, Oh, just what fraction in, uh, approximately what fraction of patients who might be eligible. So you mentioned about 15% of the clientele are eligible for a Camden map. So um, like what fraction of that might be under 60, age 65 or have uh, commercial insurance? Well, in our clinic, um, probably 20, 25% are like that. That's a huge, yeah, it's a pretty you, huge. Do you think that's close, Mike? Um, something like that. Um, yeah. And it's gonna be more, it's gonna be less in you know, your average neurologist's office, but. But we see we see the weird stuff. Yeah. I have a question about the previous trials that tried to remove amyloid plaque, and I think you showed that in many of these cases um, the cognitive function declined, uh, and I wonder if the success for this drug is mostly due to the tau removal. Hmm. And not really the amyloid. I mean, great question. Um, so some of the um, the secretase inhibitor trials show decline in cognition, and there's a reason. There was a there was a there was an, another uh, pharmacologic reason for that, and I forget, it slips my mind at the moment. But um, yeah, as a class, the beta secretase inhibitors were out uh, for that reason, um, and the gamma secretase inhibitors had trouble with notch signaling, cause trouble with notch signaling. So that that's just a bad thing to do in biology. Um, uh, in terms of the amyloid clear, the uh, amyloid antibodies, um, yeah, there's none of them that didn't clear amyloid showed any positive effects. You know, there was a big, there was a big prevention trial, A4 trial with solanezumab, and that's not an amyloid clearing antibody. There was no clearance um, and they didn't, that didn't help. Yeah. so. So, uh, and, there, and I cited one, I didn't call attention to it, but there's, there's uh, an article in Nature Reviews and Drug Therapy, I think it is, um, that I showed a slide about. I'd recommend that article if you would like to get a good synthesis of, of, of these issues. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a very nice talk. Um, kind of building off of that question, for the studies for the amyloid beta clearance that did show a positive reduction in foster tau as well, I was just curious about the timing of the, the reduction in foster tau to amyloid beta. Specifically, did they occur simultaneously or was there a delay? And a follow-up to that is, which of the two corresponded more closely to the positive outcome of cognition? Yeah, yeah super good question. And I'd say nobody knows. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a really good question. So, um, you know, there is there is the feeling in the field that, or the, the discussion at the meetings that the, the more rapidly you clear the amyloid, the better people do. Um, 
I think it's because there's a there's a lag, there's a sort of lead lag relationship. So you you clear it. There's um, the process of the brain recovering from you know isn't instantaneous, and and maybe the, there's there's a recover there's a positive curve that that lags that. What we don't really know is what happens. We follow people open label beyond 18 months. What really happens? Um, so that's one of the major uncertainties. Uh, the the biomarkers haven't been taken with that kind of time sampling that would let let your question be answered yet. That's a good question. Okay. Time for one more, I think. Thanks. Um, so I have a question about uh, the resilient population, or maybe the and also the the non-resilient population. In any of the studies of these drugs, have they been able to look at those who are particularly uh, accelerated in their in their clinical presentation or particularly uh, resilient? And is there is there any relationship between uh, sort of that that pace of uh, of clinical presentation and the and the re and the responsiveness to the drug? Well, so resilience, if you if you talk if you define resilience as you know you exceed expectations in terms of how well you're functioning given the amount of disease you have evidence for. Nobody's addressed that in clinical trial as a factor. That's a huge unmodeled piece of every clinical trial right now. You know, how you measure and estimate resilience in a living person is a problem. Okay, uh, we we know about resilience because we see autopsies and we see people who have, you know, Brock five tangles and they were normal cognition a year ago. You know, and they say, well, what is that? So pet scan, so, can't tell you about pets it. can't. Well. Stay tuned. I mean, we, we think that we think there's a way to do it. That's the part. That's part of what we're interested in doing. Yes, in a way, it's a nice kind of like tee up question for me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Um, Wish we had more time for questions, but um, Tom might be around during the break um, to answer any additional questions. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Laura Hart. She's an assistant professor in our department and also on the leadership team for the Pline Center. And I'll let her take away the panel. Thank you, Shelley. So it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's panel discussion. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Dr. Michael Rosenblum, who's a board certified neurologist at the UW Medicine Memory, Brain and Wellness Center. Next is Dr. Barack Gaster, who is a professor of medicine at the UW Division of General Internal Medicine. And Dr. Gaster has been an educator and a primary care physician at UW Medicine since 1998. And then lastly, Dr. Anurban Basu, who is a professor of health economics and the Sergaches Family Endowed Director of the Choice Institute at the UW School of Pharmacy. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. And before we hear from our panelists, I'd like to introduce a very special guest that we have here today. We're thrilled to have Andrea Gilbert join us. Andrea Gilbert is a former reporter for the Seattle Times, a retired attorney, and a fellow Husky having graduated with her law degree from the University of Washington School of Law. And she joins us today to share her perspective as one of the first patients in the Seattle area to receive lecanemab. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, welcome Andrea Gilbert up front right here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd welcome you to the, share any of your experiences in terms of your decision to, to, to receive lecanemab or any of your experiences with the whole process of receiving the, the medication. Right now? Yes, okay. yeah, thank you. Um, well, so the first question was- um, Could you just describe some considerations in your decision to receive lecanemab? I didn't have any hesitation at all. Figured if it's available, let's try it. We have an excellent doctor and Dr. Grabowski, and uh, it just sounded like a good idea to me. Is that not not resonating here? So yeah, it wasn't an issue to me at all. I just thought, why not? I mean, frankly, we have nothing to lose. We're already sort of at ground zero. So as I say, we those of us who can't 
quite measure up to what we used to. Um, so it's been a very interesting uh, time and actually one that I didn't feel very, I haven't felt any, any different. Uh, I think it's very hard to measure how you're getting better, first of all, because if you forget things, that's one thing, but if you remember them, it's hard to note that you have. Uh, <laughs> not as big a disappointment as not remembering. So. Thank you. And is there anything else that you'd like to share about your experiences in receiving Lakenna Map? Well, I have to say, uh, I give huge kudos to uh, the UW and their staff. And um, I come in every two weeks for the next 18 months, and I sit there for four hours, basically, get excellent attention. Um, they simply, I just had mine today, right here. <laughs> And um, you just you just sit there and get an infusion, and I'm hoping it'll work. Um, they give us cookies <laughs> <laughs> and juice, and uh, it's kind of going to be a very interesting thing for me to see what what difference there is, if any. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? Well, I think the first thing I said is really the most important to me, and that is how superior the University of Washington medical staff is. Um, I just feel really lucky to have decided to go this way. And uh, I enjoy the fact that everybody is so involved and interested and caring. And uh, it's a wonderful place to be. Great. Thank you so much. It's such an exciting time. And we're so grateful that you were able to join us today to share those experiences with us. I get a round of applause for Andrea. Any questions for the panelists? Do I have any questions for the panelists? <laughs> Probably have lots, but uh, I guess I'd be interested in, in really hearing what you have to say. Uh, you're looking at me. Is that <laughs> <laughs> In one, one view. <laughs> um, and so when you say that is just um, Arge Stolt about the about lecanumab and similar drugs, what we think about the whole. And what you're seeing in terms of uh, patients, you know, how are they doing better at, at immeasurably or or is there anybody any way of noticing yet to that sort of thing? Yeah, so I mean, that's a great question. And you know, a lot of the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the core concepts were kind of covered in Dr. Grabowski's great um, presentation, but, you know, we as behavioral neurologists are just thrilled to be able to offer patients other options besides, you know, Dinepazil or Mimantine. And, you know, we have a drug that met its clinical endpoints and is designed to be disease modifying if you, you know, uh, believe in the amyloid cascade hypothesis. And um, it is certainly a commitment, as you know. Um, and we do have that um, core group of patients who are willing to put in the time and willing to take the risks associated with uh, this drug, as long as you know we as clinicians, you know, do our best to to reduce the risk and do our homework in terms of making sure the patient is low risk for those amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. And you know, this is a drug that uh, will you know, slow the decline related to the disease, but it's not restoring uh, function that has been lost. And that's one of the limitations of this type of mechanism of action. So, you know, let's say you have a patient who comes in who, who can't drive anymore. Uh, you know, taking this drug is not going to allow them to, to go back to driving necessarily. And if we go back to uh, Dr. Grabowski's slide, uh, over 18 months, patients buy themselves four to five months. So they're declining slower. And so there's a whole other bucket of treatments that, you know, we really haven't talked about that um, is needed here, is some type of restorative uh, treatment. You know, if you have a stroke and the brain is damaged from the stroke and you have an aphasia, you know, the, the aphasia doesn't correct itself after the stroke is done. You have to go through um, speech therapy. And, you know, what does that look like for these patients? And, you know, if you were to ask me, what do I think... Um, the future of treatment looks like in, in this patient population, it's going to be similar to the way we treat HIV, where we have different drugs of various mechanisms working together. 
And that's just the pharmacological treatment. I think there's a lot to be said for the non-pharmacological treatment as well. And, you know, we, we are as very happy to see a drug like this, but it's not the end all be all. And we certainly um, are looking forward to the day where another um, drug that acts via the amyloid cascade hypothesis develops. And, and this, it'll probably be a combination of these drugs that makes it the great impact, or maybe a vaccine, as Dr. Bielski mentioned. How far along do you think that's, or far, how far down the road do you think that is? Uh, so, you know, said with great interest. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, some of the downs, you know, for, for me as a, uh, you know, trialist, you look at the mechanism of the disease and you think about each step where if you could start a drug, can you interfere with the pathological process? So amyloid is one thing that happens early on. But what about a drug that removes tau from the brain? And so, you know, there are trials that are, you know, are in at least phase two uh, uh, for anti-tau action. And so do you combine an anti-amyloid and anti-tau drug? And usually it takes, uh, you know, two plus years uh, for, for those results to come in. And then you have a phase three trial that could take, you know, three plus, five plus years. So, you know, I, I see this as a, probably within the next five to 10 years, we may have a, a drug of a di different mechanism uh, for this condition. Um, and then there are other drugs that uh, are anti-inflammatory or uh, help direct the, uh, the immune system to the plaques to help remove them. There's what's known as a trim, trim uh, to uh, agonists that um, have been uh, found to be quite effective in some of the early trials. So, you know, I, I think we're going to see some additional uh, mechanisms of action, you know, maybe within the next five years or so. I should just hang in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And Andrea, we welcome you to return to your seat to be comfortable to enjoy the rest of the presentation today. Thank you again. Thank you to Andrea for sharing your experiences and helping to kick off our panel discussion today. So I'd like to um, start with a question about there's been some debate about anti-amyloid agents like lecanemab and whether these represent disease-modifying versus symptomatic treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So I'll direct this question to um, Dr. Rosenblum or Dr. Gaster. Um, could you please speak to these arguments? Sure. So, you know, some of my earlier comments, I think, get to the fact that this is not, uh, you know, necessarily a symptomatic uh, medication. You give this drug, patients may not... <laughs> feel that they are sharper or their function is not necessarily restored. And, it, you know, what, what we notice, at least from uh, this 18-month trial, is that when we give a measure of cognitive and functional decline, uh, the, these patients are declining slower compared to those patients not receiving the drug. And uh, we also know from, at least from the uh, sub-studies that uh, Dr. Grabowski showed in his presentation, the impact on some of these downstream markers of tau, um, tau phosphorylation, these are the proxies for neurofibrillary tangles. Those are reduced in the treatment group um, compared to uh, placebo. So, you know, if anything, we would call it um, these modifying, but patients may not notice symptoms. And I wouldn't be surprised. You know, we have uh, one patient who now is at least three months into it, and those curves don't separate until six months um, anyway. I, you know, I don't think he's going to notice major uh, changes, that, that would be my guess. Yeah, and I guess I mean, that's such a, like, that, that's the, the, the nail that's on the head right there, which is, is, is this disease modifying or not? And it sure looks like it could be, you know, much more than anything we've had before. Um, but to me, I think the, the biggest unanswered question that, uh, that, you know, Tom Grabowski, Dr. Grabowski said really well is that we just don't know what is going to happen to people you know, past 18 months, you know, so if you look at somebody <laughs> three to four or five or six years later, um, are, you know, right now, it's like you can kind of like squint and sort of maybe see those two lines are sort of like diverging or are they parallel or like, you know, heck, as people's brains shrink, you know, they may kind of come converge and no longer even be apart. I mean, so I think to really say that this is disease modifying is aspirational and exciting. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I think 
I, you know, I'm neither sort of pro sort of lacanumab or anti lacanumab in any way. Like I really am sort of, you know, hopeful to see what the long term outcome is going to be. But to me, I think it, it, it's it's really a little bit sort of like tricky to 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 use that disease modifying sort of label uh, on the drug. And um and I, and I guess I think so much of that has to do with like how confusing and complicated Alzheimer's disease is, you know, and I think, you know, one of the points I really kind of wanted to bring out that hasn't been yet is just how, what, what a large percentage of people who have dementia have a mixed form of dementia, you know, that, um, that we would like to feel like we can really kind of categorize people as like, this is Alzheimer's disease, and this is frontotemporal uh, disease, and this is Lewy body disease, when like the reality is that when you, you know, look at people's brains under a microscope after they've died of dementia, they have a, a, a mixed picture pathologically often. And so, and, and I think that's just so important as we kind of try to imagine, you know, where will we be five or 10 or 15 years from now, which makes it different than HIV. So, I mean, in HIV, there's like, there's just like one virus that is like happening in this very sort of like careful way that we can exactly describe where everybody with AIDS is going through that same pathway. Um, whereas with dementia, um, you know, every, everybody's journey through dementia, both clinically and pathologically is like a little bit different. And so I think, um, I think, so I think the analogy is much closer to cancer than it is to HIV in that, you know, in the same way that when people sort of discovered you know, kind of mustard gas, you know, work for cancer. It wasn't like, aha, we've got like a treatment that's going to sort of be disease modifying for cancer. You know, it's taken us decades to really understand the pathophysiology of all of the, you know, many different types and subtypes of cancer to really develop sort of treatments that are effective and are disease modifying. Thank you both for that insight. I'd like to talk a little bit more about treatment of Alzheimer's disease with lecanemab. We learned a bit about how University of Washington has has rolled out their process, and um, we heard a little bit of how, how other institutions are starting to also roll out processes for um, lecanemab. And so would either of you be able to speak um, to what you know about how other institutions are approaching lecanemab therapy um, as compared to UW Medicine? Sure, and I have I've had the opportunity to connect with colleagues around the country. I actually came from Minnesota, and so I know what some institutions are doing there, and um, also uh, have colleagues on the East Coast. And uh, you know that throwaway journal that Dr. Grabowski <laughs> before you throw it away, you'll, you'll see the um, this article that uh, where where. Um, I, I was quoted, but it talks about wh what we're doing, and you can also see what they're doing at University of Alabama and at WashU, and these are our premier institutions, and everyone's different. So, you know, I know that there are institutions that are being a little bit more conservative. You know, UCSS, for instance, is taking uh, these patients in pretty slowly. Mayo as well uh, was also, um, you know, they did a lot of work at the beginning before they started uh, treating patients. And then there's other institutions like um, WashU that are ahead of the curve and they have over a hundred patients. Uh, also, you know, we took a lot of um, steps to try and balance that risk versus benefit ratio uh, so that we don't put patients at risk. And, uh, you know, we have a protocol so that anyone who has too many microhemorrhages or, you know, have, you know, is taking anticoagulation um, or, you know, if someone is E4, E4, we may uh, be less likely to give the, the drug to these individuals. So we have specific steps to kind of exclude those patients who uh, probably the risk is relatively higher in them. But there's other institutions who don't really care. And, you know, they'll treat the E4, E4s. If they're on blood thinners, that's okay. Um, and, you know, you, you should know that the Clarity AD trial did have patients who were on anticoagulation, and it was a relatively, um, you know, low number of patients who actually had bleed, so about 2.2%. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think there's a variety of approaches. And then there are other places who just can't wrap, can't wrap their mind around the infrastructure that is needed to start this up. Um, there are states that don't even have a PET scan. 
uh, to actually do the upfront amyloid um, PET imaging. Uh, it took over 50 people at University of Washington to meeting regularly for about five or six months to actually start this process up. I mean, it was pretty intense. And then we had to get buy-in, um, you know, from our, our great leaders to, you know, increase our staffing so that we can actually administer this. We, you know, we've taken on a half-time nurse, another, um, you know, a medical assistant, and there has to be a commitment at all levels to actually be able to move this forward. So it's quite variable uh, across the country. Thank you for sharing that insight. Um, in terms of treatment with lecanemab, it does rely on identifying Alzheimer's disease in its early stages. And oftentimes primary care providers are best positioned to do this. What do you see as the role of the specialist such as neurology versus primary care in diagnosing and treating Alzheimer's disease? I'll leave this to Dr. Rosenblum or Dr. Gaster. Yeah, I think before I put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, so, right, so, you know, so I am a primary care doctor and, and you know, I, I work with uh, Dr. Uh, Jacqueline Drake said uh, at Harborview, we, we, we lead a program that's called Cognition and Primary Care, which is all about um, helping primary care to get better at evaluating cognition and make it a diagnosis of, of cognitive impairment um, in its earlier stages. And, um, and I, you know, so I think, you know, as sort of, you know, Dr. Rates and I have sort of gone down this path over the last four or five years of building this program, um, it's been, you know, somewhat of a coincidence that sort of, that Lacanumab sort of showed sort of maybe some promise because, uh, you know, we really, that, that's not like, what, what our project is all about is not about Lacanumab, it's really about sort of making, uh, you know, improving care. And I think that so much of what, what we can be doing to improve care is like so much bigger than 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 uh than the anti-amyloid drug. And I think that and I you know I could uh give, give you a whole 30 minutes on, on that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sort, of, sort of skip to the kind of question of sort of like, you know, where where can where should the evaluation happen? And like there's no question that it has to happen in primary care. I mean it's 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 the front line, it's where people go when they're sort of they they have a if, if they're if they're concerned about their their if they have a shortness of breath symptom, they go see their primary care doctor. If they have a memory concern symptom, they go see their primary care doctor. Um, and, and I think that the idea that primary care sort of doesn't want to sort of engage with this disease or learn about it is wrong. Like there's really good national surveys that show that primary care uh, clinicians are aware that they sort of are undereducated and under sort of prepared to sort of know what to do when somebody comes in with a cognitive concern. And so I think um, without question, that is that needs to happen. It should happen in the primary care space. You know, like in terms of sort of where does the diagnosis happen? Um, it sort of that gets to just like what a complicated and, and sort of confusing disease this is, and where there are some situations in which like the diagnosis is absolutely clear cut, and somebody doesn't necessarily need to see a specialist. Um, they might want to, and there's nothing wrong with them um, doing so. But there's a, a tremendous number of people who are also kind of like in between, where sort of it's a little bit hard to tell. And even if they sort of go and have the big giant sort of workup at the memory brain wellness center, there still might be some uncertainty. And so there's there's always going to be a huge role for collaboration between primary care and, and specialty care. And, um, and, you know, but that's also going to be individual sort of like person by person, you know, some people are going to be like, I want to see the expert and other people are going to be like, no, I think I'm doing okay. And, and, you know, I, I don't think that we've necessarily seen anything yet in terms of MT amyloid treatment that says that, you know, everybody must see a specialist. Um, I think that, uh, that part of the, the training that Dr. Rates do is to present, you know, a, a balanced sense of like here is the, the the potential drug that is available and you know here's what you should sort of maybe know about it and and um, and if that sounds like something that you um, would like to learn more about then you know by all means um, we'd be happy to refer you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblum. Anything to add? Sure. So you know I just want to kind of get everyone up to date about what we're dealing with uh, in specialty care. So. We have these meetings where we talk about, you know, just operations. And uh, we heard this morning that we have like 500 referrals. Is that right? 500 that uh, our team has, has, has or is in the process of trying to get to so that the docs can, can review 
these referrals and decide if they're appropriate for the clinic. And, you know, we this is a, an extreme backlog, and it's because there's only so many behavioral specialists, um, even in a big city like Seattle, and we can only see so many patients. And, you know, this is nothing unique to the Memory Brain Wellness Center. You know, in Minnesota, we have the same issues. In Boston, they have the same issues. St. Louis, they have the same issues. And um, how do you figure out, you know, who does what? How does everyone work to the top of their degree? And so, you know, I find that, you know, what we bring to the table as specialists, at least right now, you know, I think, you know, someone like Dr. Gaster can do just as well as I when it comes to someone who has moderate or severe Alzheimer's disease. But when it comes to these patients with the early stage where you need to have, uh, you know, the um, expertise on how to dose these medication, you, you need the specialist for that. Even some of our um, general neurologists around the country just don't feel comfortable um, with these medications. Now, in terms of early diagnosis, you know, if these blood biomarkers eventually make it to the, you know, are FDA approved, you know, th there is also an opportunity to have those drawn within primary care. I'd be really curious to see whether or not this is something that's embraced by primary care, who are usually the first individuals to see the patients, who, um, if we get this ordered sooner rather than later, that means you can institute treatment earlier rather than later. And some of the uh, preliminary um, exploratory studies of, of the trials show that the earlier you treat the patient, you know, at least in those subgroups, they may have better outcomes. So the bottom line is the healthcare system has to do better at diagnosing this condition earlier. And we should leverage the new technology, the new biomarkers, uh, the, the blood biomarkers will be cheaper, they'll be easier accessible. And I can see that as a future where, you know, that's drawn in um, primary care. And if someone decides to get a monoclonal antibody or another type of biologic, they get referred to uh, our, our clinic. Thank you. A lot of great considerations there. I'd like to switch gears and talk about now some economic considerations because payment and cost is always a big consideration <laughs> with medications <laughs> like <laughs> Lakota. <Lekinab. laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dr. Basu, I'd like to start uh, by mentioning the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, or ICER, recently published a final evidence report on lecanemab for Alzheimer's disease. Can you describe some of the key takeaways from this report? Sure. Um, so um, ICER is an institute that tries to do an economic evaluation of new drugs coming in the market. And what they basically do is they take the price of the healthcare that's coming in the market and try to convert that that to a price of a unit of health. Um, and, and by doing so, um, as, a, as a society, as a healthcare system, we can judge whether that price for health or producing one unit of health is uh, value, valuable or not, or can we afford it um, compared to investing that same amount of money somewhere else. And uh, what ICER uh, produced the result, uh, they showed that um, for um, um it's um, the value for one unit of health was about a quarter million dollars, uh, which is about double the typical threshold people use to consider that something is valuable. And part of the reason is that um, it's not only the moderate efficacy that Dr. Grabowski was talking about, um, the, the price of the drug is about $26,000 per year. Um, and But the price of the drug is not the only cost. Um, the administration and monitoring cards cost, as we discussed this uh, afternoon, um, adds up to hundreds and thousands of dollars uh, for the healthcare system. Um, and so, um, so there are two ways to go forward. Uh, um, when, when insurance kind of tries to pay for these kind of technologies that are extremely expensive and, and deemed to be not valuable overall in the population health perspective, um, they try to pass on some of that cost to the patients. So you would see that the patients would have higher cost sharing, uh, they would be bearing the brunt um, and uh, and overall, the whole healthcare system cost increases in terms of premiums that we pay for healthcare insurance and everything. Um, on the other hand, uh, insurance do negotiate with these uh, manufacturers to bring down the price in a way 
that they can uh, sometimes guarantee a certain number of patients getting these drugs um, so that it's a revenue stream for the manufacturer, but the prices are lower. So to what extent uh, some of the Medicare plans and the commercial plans are doing this, um, it's not clear at this point, but there are a lot of uh, movements going on in the back um, to understand it's a dilemma between you know, giving access to the patients for this um, you know, uh, new novel mechanism of action, but with limited evidence on efficacy uh, versus balancing the cost for the entire healthcare system. Thank you. And to build off of that, there's been you know some debate about accessibility of drugs like lecanemab for patients and how much the out-of-pocket cost burden will be for the patient. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, so um, because this is the Medicare, this would be under Part B uh, and not the typically drug benefits, which is Part D, uh, which means that uh, the patients have, I think, about 20 percent uh, cost sharing on the on on the on on these products with no um, uh, cap, uh, which is kind of interesting because uh, with the new legislation of the IRA, uh, the small molecule drugs, um, the Part D has capped how much the patients would pay, you know, in a year, but not in Part B, and so the cost uh, burden is quite high uh, for um, for many patients. Now, having said that, um, I, I think insurance have mechanism to bring that down. And ideally, if the prices are right, uh, then there should not be any cost sharing, right? And if, if, the, if the healthcare cost is, is, is the correct amount set, you know, patients should be able to access these for free. I mean, one of the interesting things that uh, struck to me on the clinical evidence was patients above 75 years had uh, almost double the efficacy than average. And uh, and so one could easily show that, you know, if you focus, target those patients, uh, even at this price, the drug could, could be, you know, close to cost effective. Um, so so there, are, there are different ways to cut it. And the question is, can we really get these drugs to the patients who would benefit from it the most? And, and that's what we struggle with. Thank you very much for that perspective. Before I open up to questions from the audience, I have just a, a couple last questions for the panel. Um, so one is that in addition to the currently available medication therapies, there are various therapeutic agents in the pipeline for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, can you speak to some of these agents that are currently in the pipeline in a little bit more detail? <laughs> when it comes out, I'll talk. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of alluded to this, um, uh, before, but you know, you, you try to think about the, the mechanism of action that will disrupt the amyloid cascade. And so there are a variety of drugs that, as we've talked about today, that are um, amyloid monoclonal antibodies. Um, there are also drugs that are being developed as we speak um, that facilitate um, the delivery of an antibody across the blood brain barrier. So there's one uh, adjuvant known as um, brain shuttle, and that allows, uh, you know, through uh, through a mechanism, I think it's through a channel mechanism, that more of the, the drug crosses the blood-brain barrier, so you can use lower doses, and does that result in lower risks of aria? We shall see. And then if you go down the, the next um, phase of the amyloid cascade hypothesis, it's the tau um, phosphorylation and then aggregation. Um, and we're actually currently doing a trial in genetic Alzheimer's disease in patients who are presenilin 1, 2 carries an amyloid precursor protein carries. And this is a, a an, uh, the drug is known as, e, as an E2814, um, which, you know, it probably doesn't mean anything to anybody. It barely means anything to me. But um, this uh, blocks aggregation of the tau which hopefully leads to fewer tangles in the brain. And so that's another drug that um, perhaps in this uh, genetic population, if it's found to be efficacious, can be moved to sporadic or you know, everyday um, Alzheimer's disease. And you know, there's in many ways to um, block um, tau um, aggregation. You can uh, you know, take it out with um, a monoclonal antibody as well. 
Um, there's also um, antisense RNA where you kind of affect the, the production of the protein itself. And so I, I believe that the, tar the, the tau molecule is a really hot target, but E2814 is the one that I think I put my money on in, in, in that anti-tau category. Uh, I recently, um, you know, been reading quite a bit about uh, TRIM2 uh, agonists. TRIM2 is, uh, it's a transmembrane protein, and it's responsible for uh, chemotaxis. So if there's amyloid in the brain, uh, it will direct the, uh, you know, the, the, the immune system to the amyloid plaque, and then the plaque is digested. And so actually it's removing plaques in a, in, through a different mechanism of action than uh, lecanemab. It also uh, works through a, a lipid uh, pathway, which we think is somewhat um, connected to some of these events. Uh, it removes uh, synapses that have been uh, damaged. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's you know, I, I see it as kind of under that category of inflammation or, or anti-inflammation as well. So. Uh, you know, those are the drugs that I think are, are really uh, fascinating to me. I also think there's a quite a bit of neglect of restorative treatment. So, you know, you can give a drug that's quote unquote disease modifying, but until you find something that restores the damaged neurons or the damaged synapses, patients are going to still have these deficits. And what can you give? Um, and, you know, people talked hypothetically about growth factors. Those really not, have not turned out terribly well. Um, you know, one of my interests is non-invasive neurostimulation or, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is used in psychiatry uh, to stimulate a part of the brain that's responsible for mood. And by doing that, you can take care, you can take advantage of neuroplasticity and new synapses are formed. Patients have improved mood over four to six weeks. And if you can treat brain areas responsible for mood, why can't you do that for cognition and memory? And there's a great paper that was published in Brain uh, within the past year that looked at a six-month trial, and, that, and they got great data with TMS and the same outcome measures like the CDR sum of boxes. So I think we need to keep an open mind of the different mechanisms of action. And then Again, the work that Barack um, does, the non-pharmacological interventions through like the ADAPT program, which is a, is a program that's like a brain boot camp uh, at um, Memory and Brain Wellness Center. These are all complementary therapies that I think need to be uh, used um, as adjunctive interventions when you give biologics. Yeah, and so I'll, I hate to say this at a, a school of pharmacy sort of talk, um, but I, I am... You know, if I had to sort of, you know, predict what do like the the lion's share of people in, in the United States who are currently living with mild cognitive impairment sort of like what do they need and what sort of what what will the, the help that they are gonna get, it, it's it's not gonna be uh, a pharmaceutical, it's gonna be the list of six to eight other things that we can be doing right now to improve the the brain health of people with mild cognitive impairment, and it's like reducing alcohol intake, and it's treating sleep apnea, and it's wearing hearing aids, and it's uh, reducing the over-the-counter diphenhydramine that nobody take, knows that they're taking. Like those are like concrete things that we can be doing right now that can like absolutely sort of like you know sort of bend the you know, turn the needle, bend the curve, or whatever you want to call it in terms of um, what we can be doing now. And, and so I think. You know that there's no question that we need to improve de early detection. We need to um, we need to really sort of bring people sort of out out of the shadows and into care um, in really concrete ways that can make a difference. And I mean, I think that the 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 slide that Dr. Grabowski showed of the the the, the 18 sort of failed trials of of, you know, of amyloid treatment, um, it, it I mean, I think it's just really worth um, remembering that like. Two years ago, we really thought the amyloid hypothesis was dead. You know, I mean, it's like there was, it was just like over and over again, the trial failed, the trial failed, the trial failed. And then it's like, you know, oh, wait, all of a sudden we got a signal and that's like really exciting. And I'm like absolutely sort of like thrilled and, and excited about that. And it, it definitely makes me more optimistic for like what might be sort of coming down the pike. But I think we also just need to sort of come back to sort of like the fundamentals, which is the things that we can be, should be doing right now to sort of improve brain health.
Thank you both for that perspective. And I will say that as pharmacists caring for older adults, whenever we can use a non-pharmacologic approach, approach and reduce exposure to medication, uh, we love to do that. So um, I would say uh, it really resonated to me what you both mentioned earlier about viewing treatment of Alzheimer's disease and dementia similar to treating something like HIV or cancer and a, a multifactorial approach that includes not only pharmacologic therapy, but also non-pharmacologic therapy. And I think that's something really important to keep in mind as we think about the future of treating dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, to wrap up our panel discussion, we do have some time for the audience to ask some questions. So we'll go ahead and open it up. So I'm quite intrigued as a community pharmacist because I see people all the time dealing with these issues. Um, I'm getting ready to launch a brain health initiative in my pharmacy, and there's a, an FDA approved device that measures cognition. And that's what people need are numbers to measure. And, uh, you know, so if you get it done every year on your birthday or so you get it done every six months or something like that. Um, but I think it's to start the conversation about um, dementia, aging. You know, there's a boatload of baby boomers out there. They're all worried about brain health. And I think if we could address it in a positive way, in an accessible way, that we could make a little um, change in the pattern here of getting people to see their primary care physician. And that was my question before you answered it, that, you know, are the primary care physicians going to be able to... Um, are they going to be receptive to the idea of getting people sooner rather than later? And it, and it sounds like that is part of it. But I feel like pharmacists see people way more often than doctors. They see people way more often than any other healthcare provider. And we're trusted by the families that we deal with. And, you know, a lot of times I feel like I can spot it before the family can. And, and so I feel like primary care pharmacy also has uh, you know, a huge role that we could be um, playing in this whole thing. And I'm ready to launch my brain health in the next little bit. I'll let you know. Keep keep posted. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So actually, it's funny. Um, I appreciate that comment. And, you know, I've actually practiced in Minnesota for the past 13 years. And we had a program known as the Six Vital Sign Project, where we actually use the mini cog um, right around the uh, right before the Medicare annual wellness visit was started um, at our organization in primary care. And so we did work with primary care to, to institute that, but also we worked with other pharmacists in the greater Twin Cities, including Walgreens, CVS, and taught them to administer the, the mini cog and as a way to maybe objectively pick up some of these patients from the community. Well, it starts a conversation, I think, in a positive way. You know, we're measuring brain health. That's what we want to do. And so I, I feel like we can start on a positive note to begin with. And, um, you know, just what do we do this information? I guess that's the question is, you know, what comes next. But I can tell you a lot of people are interested in this. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Uh, first of all, thank you all for this great panel discussion. Um, one of the questions that I've been thinking about is the early detection piece and how this is um, was heavily stated by all of the panelists and our uh, speaker about how important it is. But one of the things that's kind of lingering in the back of my mind is um, stigma that's still associated with um, Alzheimer's dementia and how you are um, kind of encountering this with patients talking about it, um, especially when pushing a bit more early detection, um, if there's concerns that uh, patients are bringing forward with um, stigma and how best we can as professionals to help combat it. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, one of the big uh, things that we highlight the most that in the, the training that Dr. Rates and I do for primary care is just to really make the case of how much better people's sort of lives and care are when this diagnosis gets made, you know, because when people are kind of like sort of drifting through their lives and our health system undiagnosed, it's not that they are sort of necessarily doing well. You know, there, there, there is there is a lot of anxiety, there is a lot of concern, there's a lot of confusion that's sort of like swirling around that sort of undiagnosed person. And that uh, like breaking through that kind of like that sort of like 
that hesitation to sort of like call the pedal black is really uh, is actually can dramatically improve people's lives. And I think so I think that's like the message that sort of that Dr. Rates and I give to primary care and that primary care hears and understands. And I think that patients and families understand it as well. You know, that the, the, the number one thing that we can do in primary care with a diagnosis is really helping people to sort of understand that it's really, you shouldn't come to the doctor by yourself anymore. You know, that there, there's just like too many things that are sort of can do and should be sort of helping you with that you really need sort of your family member or close friend there with you to, to help with. And I think that's sort of the, that I think we can really get to the point where uh, it's okay to sort of talk about it when we start talking about the ways that their, that their lives can be better. Yeah, I think it's incumbent upon those of us in the healthcare industry to try and destigmatize these diseases. I mean, it, it, you see the same thing in mental health and, you know, not knowing or, or sweeping it under the table does nobody any good. In fact, the outcomes are, are worse. And, you know, I know that, you know, at least back where I practiced, there were very well-esteemed uh, dementia specialists who will give, who give the diagnosis and say, okay, get your affairs in, an or in order, and, you know, that's it. And, and the sessions went terribly, and it only yeah. worsened the stigma associated with the disease. And, you know, personally, what I try to do is when I have someone um, in the clinic, you know, who's of older than 65, we talk about, you know, living long, having chronic disease, you know, this is a chronic disease just like heart failure or diabetes or hypertension. And, you know, you have to live and adjust your life accordingly. And we also, you know, patients are surprised to learn that actually, if I were to see you in six months from now, we probably wouldn't notice a big difference. And, you know, trying to spin this in a realistic way um, and, and um, you know, helping them to realize that, yes, you know, this, this is a, a disease that can lead to significant cognitive impairment. But most people think about being in a nursing home, not recognizing family members, and that's not, you know, the majority of the patients that we see, at least in our clinic. And I, I just said, um, you know, that, 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 that sort of, that hook of like how, you know, actually, this is not the end of the world at all. And, the, you know, this is a very, very slow moving disease. And the odds that you are going to be sort of almost the same a year from now as you are today is actually very high. And I always sort of like, that's always in the back of my mind when I hear about the four to five month sort of delay from this mm -hmm. drug which is that the reality is that you really often can't tell any difference between somebody four to five months later who has this disease. And so, so like, so it's just, it's important to put that sort of four to five month delay in the context of a very, very long trajectory of a very slow moving disease that you often can't tell the difference between a four to five month sort of change and somebody um, is sort of important to sort of keep on. Okay. I'll try to be loud. Um, yeah, I think that early detection is so key. And I think being in this area, in this area with all the wonderful experts, I mean, what you're describing sounds wonderful. I had this experience with my mother back in a small town in Michigan where it's very, very different, I think, in terms of even screening in primary care. Um, and so with that said, I'm just wondering, I may have missed this in your presentation, but how close are we to using blood um, biomarkers for diagnosis? So, you know, I, it would probably be guesswork on my end, but I can tell you this. So there, there are certain centers in this country who skip the CSF and skip the uh, amyloid PET scan and use the blood to rule in patients for Lakembi. And so, you know, this, this tells you that, you know, well-established institutions feel comfortable enough uh, to using these. And I, you know, if there is a mechanism for reimbursement for these tests, if they become FDA approved, then they're going to be pretty standardized. Um, you know, in, in my mind, I can see it in maybe one to two years, maybe more than two years. Um, maybe others have other uh, thoughts, but I mean the, the data, as uh, Dr. Grabowski said, it's very compelling. I mean it it does it measures up pretty well 
you know, against uh, the, the traditional biomarkers that we're currently using. And we're talking about tens of thousands of patients where these tests have been validated. So, um, yeah, I think the standard uh, that the spinal fluid tests were held to was 90% accuracy on predicting the amyloid PET scan. And there are blood tests now that pass that mark. So it's only a matter of time. I think a year or two is realistic. Yeah. And I, I'll just sort of, uh, we got reality check us, which is that, um, that the blood biomarkers are going to sort of be very, very predictive of a PET scan. Yeah. And the question then, though, is how predictive is the PET scan? <laughs> and, 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 you know, and so, and so I think the, 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 the term that you used in your talk, uh, Tom, was like, great, which is that these are, these are tests that can certify a diagnosis, you know, and that's very, very different than screening for a diagnosis. Oh, yeah. If I could amplify that. Yeah. I mean, yes. the difference between the way, the way MCI behaves in our clinic is not the way MCI is going to behave in the screening situation. In our clinic, people have done whatever they need to do, jump through whatever hoops they need to do. They're motivated enough. They have enough complaint that they're going to see us. The prior probability that there's a problem is higher. In primary care, if you just give a screening test, you don't know, did they not sleep well last night? Are they sick for some other reason? What else is going on? And in a way, it's almost the second test in primary care is more important than one that shows change. So you have to be really careful in the screening situation. And, and I think that what is going to be confusing for primary care and uh, is going to be people are going to want to latch on to a, a, a blood-based marker for amyloid or tau um, as if it's a hemoglobin A1C. You know, and that that's the test that's like, aha, you've got diabetes. Well, now let's go. And the we are so far, at least as I mean, you, you the two of you know this data better than I do, but the data that I have seen is really not that that a PET scan or a, a, a blood-based biomarker for amyloid is like a, has a very fuzzy predictive sort of value on predicting who is going to develop sort of you know cognitive impairment or or whose cognitive impairment is going to progress as opposed to sort of stay more static. And, and, and so, I mean, th that, that's the data that I think we should be sort of looking for to see you know, sort of like what, how, what will be the sort of the, how will blood-based biomarkers be used? And, you know, but what's dangerous though is that they will kind of just like kind of plop into the market and patients will ask for it and sort of doctors will start ordering it and we won't really know what to do with it. And there's going to be misdiagnoses and underdiagnoses based on biomarker results. You know, I mean, people will be like, you know, I've got a cognitive concern. Oh, but my biomarker is fine. Like, don't worry. You know, like potential terrible harm that can come. You know, and, and so I think it's, it's going to be, I, I really think of it as it's going to be for sure part of the kind of, you know, diagnostic armamentarium that is going to include a cognitive test and sort of, you know, an, an interview with the observer, a family member, a close friend, and, you know, brain imaging and sort of a biomarker. And we're going to sort of need to sort of synthesize those things together. And that's, that's going to be the big important value of biomarkers, not as a screening test. I would also say that uh, if we go back in time and we look at um, when amyloid PET became available and the, the, those um, ligands became FDA approved, um, there, uh, there were various societies that put, put together appropriate use criteria for amyloid PET imaging. And that included, you know, uh, using it for patients who are symptomatic, not using it as a screening device or not using it as a, as a means to, let's say, uh, for an insurance company. And, you know, those similar types of rules, we may not have to do that once the, the blood biomarkers become clinically available. Thank you all for your insight. I'm going to have to wrap us up here with the panel. Thank you so much for this great discussion today. Can I get a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. So we're going to take a short break and return at 3.05. Okay.
Thank you. Yeah, All right, I'm an assistant teaching professor at the School of Pharmacy and also serve as the assistant director for outreach for the Pline Center. And I'm pleased to be here with you all today. Um, for this last session, we're highlighting some research updates from faculty and trainees in the Pline Center. We'll hear from a variety of research and education topics related to older adults. Each presenter will speak for about 12 minutes. <laughs> we're trying to stay on time today uh, with a couple minutes for Q&A at the end of each talk. So get your questions ready. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Jing Li, a colleague of mine, who is an assistant professor of health economics in the Department of Pharmacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Li. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you all today. And um, I'm personally really fascinated by the conversation for the talk that um, we just heard like, oh, from the panelists and also uh, Dr. Grabowski. So today, um, for my own research, I'm going to talk about, you know, something that, you know, might pique the interest of a lot of you or all of you which is the relationship between dementia and long-run changes in financial health among uh, U.S. households. So we touched a little bit about patient cost burdens and financial impact, but uh, I just wanted to show you some sort of research in progress that we're doing that really kind of honing on a lot of those uh, impacts. So why is this an important topic? So I don't have to kind of repeat the stats um, that you probably have seen um, before, that one in nine, about one in nine, uh, uh, older adults age 65 plus in the U.S. has uh, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in 2023. And um, dementia incurs very high health care and long-term care costs each year. So this is something uh, we kind of touched on a little bit. Um, so the reason why dementia is a very expensive condition is because people with chronic conditions and also dementia cost more than folks with the same chronic conditions, but not without, you know, but without dementia. So they incur very high healthcare costs. Uh, some of that also is at the end of life, uh, also long-term care costs. So because of the loss in sort of memory and functional status, a lot of the moderate to late stage dementia patients require round of clock care. Uh, a lot of them are in nursing homes. So those are expensive um, unless you, you know, and a lot of them are paying that out of pocket unless you have Medicaid, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later. So a uh, literature estimates these costs at about uh, $50,000 a year. Uh, and over a lifetime, it's close to uh, $400,000. So it's an expensive condition. But one another thing, another kind of harm that dementia or cognitive impairment is doing is that it actually affects financial decision making. Um, so I'm going to talk more about that later. And this is a very kind of a scary uh, scenario because obviously, as you get older, uh, you require more financial resources to take care of yourself. But at the same time, you actually lose can lose the ability to, to properly manage your finances. So we kind of find some uh, evidence of that. Um, so this is really kind of, I probably don't need to, to spend much time on this, but this is just kind of irritated what uh, Dr. Grabowski is talking about. So there's a long preclinical pre phase of dementia uh, that occurs even before mild cognitive impairment where patholo pathological changes are occurring but don't impact uh, cognition yet. So there are a lot of things that could be happening before someone actually gets a diagnosis uh, during the preclinical phase, which is uh, can be up to 15 years, and MCI phase, which I think is about uh, can be up to five years. So this is uh, the work that we did uh, that was uh, published in uh, JAMA Neurology um, in 2023. So what we did is that we looked at um, what dementia does to a person's uh, net worth and financial wealth. So net worth is just how much money you have in total, right? So your total assets minus your total debts. Um, so what we did is that we, uh, so I'll talk a bit more about the data sources later, but we basically used nationally representative survey data. And then we built a cohort of people with uh, dementia. So this is uh, persons with probable dementia and a control cohort where people did not experience dementia. So what's the note is that uh, the dementia onset time, which is time zero here, is actually not diagnosis time because everyone gets diagnosed at different point, kind of depending on sort of their interaction with the healthcare system. So we actually use the cognitive assessment uh, tools, sort of information available in a survey, which kind of treats everyone equally, right? So if objectively your cognitive assessment tells us that you have dementia, we kind of flagged you as having dementia. So we look back on these individuals about eight to 10 years uh, prior, and also like about six years into their dementia diagnosis. 
So we saw that for your net worth, um, the dementia cohort and the control cohort start to diverge as early as eight to 10 years before dementia uh, onset. The divergence is actually pretty uh, pretty high. So by the time of dementia onset, um, the dementia group had about uh, half, this is median uh, total uh, household net worth compared to controls. And kind of the same pattern uh, occurs in just financial house. So financial house are just you know the liquid assets that you have. Um, the divergence is a little bit even more kind of drastic. Uh, it's not as much in home ownership, which is something that, you know, the home, whether you own a home or not, the fraction of home ownership. Um, so we're kind of interested in what really explains these patterns because this could have dramatic consequences, you know, for just all aspects of our lives, right? So not only that we have dementia, you know, we have issues with everyday living, potentially, but we're losing money, even like eight to 10 years, starting eight to 10 years before uh, dementia mm -hmm. onset. So we had a few hypotheses about why this is the case. So our first two hypotheses had to do with income, and the second two hypotheses had to do with spending. So the first hypothesis is that because of your cognitive impairment, you had difficulty participating in the labor force, so you have to maybe retire early or cut down, cut back down your hours of work. That affected your earnings uh, and downstream social security retirement income, because the social security income affects uh, is affected by how much you earn and how long you worked. The second hypothesis is uh, sort of what I was talking about before. So there's impaired judgment on financial decision making. So maybe as the cognitive impairment kind of starts to to get more severe, you have trouble maybe you know managing your stocks or some of the risky assets you have or whatever you know side businesses you have. And you're starting to lose uh, that income you could have had if you were to have sort of uh, intact uh, cognition. So the third hypothesis that is sort of a more standard, maybe you're just, you know, because of higher out-of-pocket healthcare spending, you have to spend more on healthcare. And that could happen even before uh, dementia onset. And the last one is, has to do with the Medicaid. So uh, as I mentioned before, in order to qualify for some sort of coverage of um, nursing home, um, one has to qualify for Medicaid. So that's the only sort of government program that actually would pay for long-term care in this country. Um, so um, there, it could be that people have foresight knowing that they will end up in nursing homes and they start to sort of precautionally spend down their assets to qualify for Medicaid because uh, as probably some of you know, Medicaid uh, eligibility depends on your assets and, and your income. So it could be that they're intentionally spending down uh, their assets. Um, so each of these hypotheses are associated with different um, uh, testable results um, that we can look at. So the, the last hypothesis means that your total household spending is gonna go up um, and possibly you're gonna sell your home. So your home ownership might go, uh, might go down as well. Um, so the, um, I'm sorry, I think that I've talked about the first one and the second one, the financial income is gonna decrease and the third one, you're gonna have higher out-of-pocket healthcare spending. So we can look at each of these uh, testable hypotheses and, and kind of uh, thinking about what might be explaining uh, the results. So how do we do that? We're examining these hypotheses using the uh, about two, two decades of longitudinal health and retirement study uh, data. So this data uh, is actually interviews of about 20,000 US older adults aged uh, 50 plus. So they're nationally representative of the US community dwelling older adults, so very high quality. And has detailed information on social demographics, uh, health, uh, cognition, and household finances. So what we did is that we uh, constructed two cohorts, uh, as you kind of saw before, with similar weighted characteristics. So we want to make sure that obviously people with dementia had a lot of differences compared to people uh, without dementia. So I want to make sure to reduce that differences, such that whatever uh, differences in finances that we saw could plausibly be due to dementia itself and not other things. So basically, we try to make sure that these two cohorts have similar uh, education, age, um, I think the other ones are uh, marital status um, and sex. So I'll show you some of those uh, characteristics later. So we have about 2,000, uh, 2,300 adults who are in our case group that in, who experience incident dementia during this period and about uh, 8,000 uh, who are dementia free. So these are our uh, sort of summary stats. So we have the age, uh, sex and education and also marital status. So up to here. So these first group of characteristics we did sort of matching or uh, weighting 
to make sure that uh, the controls look like cases along these dimensions. Um, for race and ethnicity and chronic conditions, we did not do uh, this kind of statistical adjustment to make sure that they're similar. Um, so you saw that people who had infant dementia, uh, they're more likely to be racial ethnic minorities and more likely to have uh, all kinds of sort of uh, chronic conditions. But overall, these two groups look very similar. So this is what we found. So as I was talking about before, uh, depending on which hypothesis, it could show up in different uh, income or spending measures. So we saw that the total household income, there's sort of uh, um, an obvious, so I will show uh, versions with uh, confidence intervals later. This is just sort of a very descriptive uh, result. So total household income did also start to diverge um, about sort of eight to 10 years. Um, and then uh, we specifically looked at individual earnings, which is the money that you get from working. So obviously this is sort of older adult groups and a lot of them are retired, but um, still a sort of a, a moderate fraction are working. So the fraction who had any individual earnings is visibly lower, uh, declining faster among the dementia group, which kind of proves our point that it's something about labor force participation. So these people with dementia are probably, um, for one re way, reason or another, had to cut back on work uh, and then they had less earnings. Um, so you, we also look at the pension uh, income and also social security. So there's again, visible divergence in both pension uh, and social security income. So both had to do with sort of, you know, your work um, and how long you work. And the last two things we looked at is sort of uh, financial income. So capital income. So money that you maybe you make from your rentals or from sort of investing in stocks. Um, and then lastly, the checking and uh, uh, bonds and CD income is sort of a a part of that, that capital income. So both of these financial income measures show a very uh, significant decline among the case groups. So to the extent that it pretty much dropped down to zero at dementia onset, uh, whereas for the for the, uh, the control group, it's sort of relatively flat. Um, so these kind of patterns um, suggest that both the labor force participation and also the, uh, the financial decision-making could be playing a role. So next we look at spending. So remember we have two more hypotheses. One is uh, maybe you're spending more on healthcare. The other one, the last one is maybe you're just intentionally spending on, on your excess for because of you wanna qualify for Medicaid. So we found evidence for neither. Uh, we saw that the total healthcare spending actually was not uh, higher for the dementia group, uh, which is the, the green line before dementia onset. And actually, over, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, this total household spending, sorry. So total household spending actually stayed fairly low uh, among the case group compared to control like throughout their study period. So if you just look at out-of-pocket healthcare spending, um, it only went up for the cases relative to controls at dementia onset, but not before. So before is sort of really a pretty parallel, um, which means that it's not, at least for the pre-dementia divergence in household assets, it's not really explained by healthcare spending. So the last two uh, graphs uh, tell us something about nursing homes. So we we're thinking that if the dementia group know in advance that they might end up in nursing homes, they might start, um, pre you know, uh, intentionally spend that. We didn't find that, that that's the case. So it's not likely that they know that they're going to end up in nursing homes more than a control group, even though they did end up in nursing homes uh, more often than a control group. So this is just a event study results, which is <laughs> yeah. Confidence intervals on those and that are consistent with the more descriptive ones, which I'm not gonna go over. So just to summarize, what did we learn? Uh, so in terms of the first hypothesis, we saw that earnings went down, social security retirement income went down. So difficult, the first hypothesis, um, we find positive evidence for that. And same as the second one, we find that financial income uh, went down. Uh, we didn't find much going on with out-of-pocket healthcare spending before dementia onset, uh, which tells us that it's not really driving the results as much. And lastly, we find we didn't find much evidence on spending down uh, either. So uh, quickly, just to wrap up, what are the implications? Why do we care about the results here? So just want to reinforce the early detection of cognitive impairment. It's really important that we understand that there is a risk of cognitive impairment so that we can uh, start planning earlier. So early financial planning might help mitigate some of those losses. Uh, and it's very important to involve trusted uh, financial consultants and family members in managing uh, household finances. So uh, that concludes my uh, the presentation. So acknowledgement from my, of my co-authors uh, from different institutions and uh, funding from NIA.
Thank you so much. We have a few minutes for questions from the audience. It's okay. You said the silence is deafening, but as a as a teacher, you kind of get used to it. I'll give you I'll give you your time to think if anything comes up. Thank you so much for that presentation. I was wondering, it looked like some of the graphs um, that the two groups didn't really st start at the same point. Mm -hmm. um, can you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think for the graphs with all the confidence intervals, um, because we did the control groups in a like a reweighted uh, median, so it could be that we're overcorrecting some of that differences uh, initially, but I think in the, will we put confidence interval bands around those? So those are indistinguishable. But yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, great talk, uh, Jing. Um, I was wondering, um, so is the decline intentional or is it because of decision-making or impaired decision-making abilities? So if I understand your question correctly, you're asking if um, the the dementia people sort of, they meant for that to happen? Or yeah. For, as you said, Medicaid and nursing home and all those kind of things. Yeah. Passing on early on, writing a will and passing their assets to their kids and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a good question. So we don't find evidence that it's intentional because it seems that they didn't know more than the control group that they're going to end up in nursing homes from the self-reported probability. We actually found that they received more money from their, actually, I didn't show the results here, but they actually received more money from their uh, families after dementia onset. And now we do believe that a lot of that is, because it's not like they're spending more. It's just that they're receiving less money in terms of their income. So we think that it's um, more of a financial decision-making labor force participation story. Yes. See if you wait long enough. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jing. Uh, and just yeah, related, I, and I can't remember if you talked about this, but were, were you? Did you ever look at it uh, with the linked claims to see who has diagnoses and who doesn't, uh, and to see if the results vary across who has diagnoses? Because then you might know. Because then if they if they know that they have uh, dementia or or any of the any related diagnosis, how, how their behavior differs. That is, uh, that is on our to do list. Um, I definitely recall that 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 was your uh, feedback. Well, I'll go by that. It's just, it's. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've done it yet. I two years ago, yeah. Sorry, I did have a baby during that two years, so that's my excuse. <laughs> sorry, but no, that's uh, that's what I'm trying to lose. But to answer your question, but yeah, so that does require linking to Medicare claims data, which is um, pain in and of itself. But that's not an excuse. We should do. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Any have come up? Right. If not, then one more thank you to Dr. Lee. All right. On to the next one. Uh, next up is, again, Dr. Laura Hart, who I'll introduce again. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the Department of Pharmacy as well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hart. Thank you, Dr. Winter. So I'll be presenting today on implementation of an escape room activity in a geriatric pharmacotherapy elective course. So between 2018 and uh, January of this year, I was faculty at University of California, San Diego before beginning my job here at University of Washington. So I'm gonna be talking about an activity that I did in my geriatrics elective course at UC San Diego. And this escape room activity was specifically designed to teach students about the American Geriatric Society beers criteria. So the American Geriatric Society or AGS beers criteria represent a list of medications that are considered potentially inappropriate for use in older adults, meaning that the risks outweigh the potential benefits of those medications. And the purpose of the beers criteria is multifaceted. Um, the beers criteria are meant to improve medication selection and use in older patients to reduce their exposure to potentially inappropriate medications to ultimately reduce the risk of medication-related harm. And the beers criteria serve as a very important clinical tool for pharmacists and other healthcare professionals. 
The beer's criteria are broken down into five broad categories as shown on this slide for your reference. And in thinking about teaching the beer's criteria to pharmacy students, I decided that perhaps a straight lecture format may not be the most effective or optimal way to teach this content. And so I sought to teach this content in another way, which brings us to the topic of gamification in pharmacy education. So gamification essentially refers to the use of game design and game elements in non-game contexts. And gamification has actually been increasingly used as a teaching tool in pharmacy education. And a major example of gamification in pharmacy education is the use of escape rooms. And just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of an escape room? Awesome, how many have completed an escape room? Few, okay, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, an escape room essentially entails locking a group of people in a room and they are required to solve different puzzles and gather different clues in order to escape in a set amount of time. And believe it or not, a lot of people like to do this for fun, um, but including myself, which is where I got the idea for this activity. Um, and so essentially I decided to use an escape room format to teach students about the beers criteria, specifically to introduce them to the purpose of the criteria, also how to navigate and apply the criteria. And I sought to study the impact of this activity. Um, my objectives were to evaluate the impact of the activity on students' knowledge and confidence in using the beers criteria, as well as assess their overall perceptions of the activity. So this slide shows an overview of how this activity was implemented and assessed. So one week prior to the activity, students filled out an anonymous online survey. And the survey was meant to assess their baseline knowledge and confidence related to the beers criteria. Also one week prior to the escape room activity, I provided a 15 minute primer lecture to introduce students to the purpose and the structure of the beers criteria. And then for the escape room activity itself, the students were divided into groups of three to four and given 30 minutes to escape. And this was conducted in person, but it was delivered online via a virtual platform, which I'll discuss more in a moment. And the escape room in, uh, essentially required students to find eight different clues in order to um, generate a 12 digit code to escape the room. So the escape room was again housed online. It was created using a combination of Google Slides and Google Forms. And the escape room premise was essentially a pharmacist locked in a geriatrics primary care clinic after hours. And each clue in the escape room was anchored around an older adult patient case. And the students had to apply the beers criteria in order to solve each clue. And so you might be wondering, well, what did this look like? So I wanna take a moment to just introduce you to the design and function of this escape room. So the students um, at the beginning of the activity uh, were given a hyperlink to access the escape room and it took them to this main slide here that tells them that they're locked in the clinic. They need to click on the door to learn more. And I do wanna show you that there were various hidden hyperlinks embedded throughout this slide. So everything that you see that is surrounded by a black dotted line represents a hidden hyperlink that would open to either a Google document or a Google form. And so if the students started by clicking on the door, they would get this premise in a Google document that shared with them that they're locked in this clinic after hours after seeing their last patient of the day, Mr. A. All the escape room clues were anchored around this patient, Mr. A. Um, they're told they need to uh, have a 12 digit numerical code to unlock the door to escape and are instructed to find clues scattered throughout this clinic reception area to generate that code. And they're given 30 minutes. I projected a timer at the front of the classroom to help them keep track of time and, you know, instill that sense of, of fear. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so when students uh, then clicked around the room, if they clicked on different objects, it would um, bring them to different clues. So here's an example of a clue. So this clue says that one of the patient's medications should be um, avoided in older patients due to, due to a severe risk of prolonged hypoglycemia. And they're instructed to, to note the rank order of this medication on the list. And so the answer is glyburide, and that is number four on the list. So if they enter four as their answer, it would tell them that they're correct. If they entered an incorrect number, it would tell them that they're incorrect and to try again. Students did have unlimited attempts to solve each clue. And they were allowed to ask for one hint. Each group was allowed one hint 
through that, throughout the activity in order to access the hint, I asked them a question that uh, required them to apply the beers criteria to answer something about a drug-drug interaction. And then they were given a clue. So here's, that was one example of a clue. Here was another type of clue that required them to solve a puzzle. So they would, were first required to identify a medication with highly anticholinergic properties on this patient's medication list. They were having to list the first four letters. So the medication is diphenhydramine. So they would list D-I-P-H and they're told that each letter is associated with, associated with a number. The sum would give them the third and fourth numbers of the code. And they had to use this little key that's shown there in order to solve this puzzle to get the third and fourth numbers of the code. So essentially they would continue clicking around the room finding different clues until they had all eight clues. And then once they gathered all eight clues, they could click on the door lock and they had to enter the correct 12 digit numerical code in order to escape. And they were instructed if they didn't yet have all of the, the digits, they had to continue looking for clues. And again, each clue would tell them if they were correct or incorrect. So they would try it as many times as they needed to get it correct in order to gather all of the clues. So how did students fare in this activity? I'm pleased to report that all of the teams successfully escaped in the allotted 30 minutes. None of them had to spend the night in the clinic after hours. Um, the time to escape was uh, on average 16 minutes, but there was quite a large range. The fastest team finished in nine and a half minutes. The team that took the longest, um, it took them 27 and a half minutes. And four teams, about a third of the teams required a hint and as I mentioned, um, I did survey the students. Um, so I gave them a survey pre-activity as well as a survey post-activity to assess knowledge and confidence as well as perceptions of the activity. So let's look at some of those outcomes. So to assess student knowledge pre and post-activity, I had them answer a series of multiple choice questions within the survey. Um, I don't wanna spend a lot of time going over the details of this, but I, I would like to point out that students um, did demonstrate a significant improvement in performance post activity in the various um, multiple choice questions. So again, here are some of the other questions just for reference, but for the sake of time, I won't spend a lot of time going over them, but the questions essentially just highlighted some, some key takeaways from the peers criteria. And then in terms of looking at student perceptions, pre and post activity, I had them rate their level of agreement with three statements that are shown in this table here using a Likert scale where one was strongly disagree, five was strongly agree. So I wanted to assess um, whether they agree that they understood the purpose of the beers criteria, as well as their confidence in navigating the criteria and their confidence in applying the criteria to identify potentially inappropriate medications. And we did see a significant increase um, in each of these areas, post-activity as compared to pre-activity. In the post-activity survey, I also gathered student perceptions. Um, as, you can, <laughs> as you can see, um, for, for most of these, uh, these statements, uh, students agreed or strongly agreed um, to them that they enjoyed the activity and encouraged them to think about the material in a new way. They learned from their peers. They preferred learning about the beers criteria through this mechanism as opposed to a traditional lecture. Um, the activity was effective and they would recommend it to other students. I was pleased to see that the majority of students disagreed or strongly disagreed that the activity caused them stress because it was meant to be a fun learning experience. Uh, in the post-activity survey, students had the opportunity to provide written comments. Um, the feedback via these comments was overwhelmingly positive. Students um, expressed that they found the activity fun, that it was enjoyable, that they um, hoped that this activity could be used again for upcoming years or in other contexts. And just anecdotal, anecdotally, um, on my end of the quarter course evaluations, um, multiple students commented in the course evaluations that they really enjoyed this activity and they would hope that something like this could be used again. So um, in terms of um, some key takeaways from this project, the, this escape room activity was effective in enhancing student knowledge related to the beers criteria and potentially inappropriate medications, as well as enhancing their confidence in using the criteria and their perceptions of the activity were overwhelmingly positive. Um, so again, most students agreed or strongly agreed that they would recommend the activity to others, that the activity was enjoyable, 
effective for their learning and preferable to a traditional lecture format. In terms of um, future directions, so this escape room has actually already been used as a blueprint to teach other content. One of my colleagues at UC San Diego adopted the template that I used for this escape room um, to use it in an applied skills course. And then here at the UW School of Pharmacy, I taught a lecture on um, treating cardiovascular disease in older adults in the geriatric pharmacotherapeutics course. And so I used this escape room template as a way to review key concepts in cardiovascular disease in older patients before jumping in to um, some complex case discussions. And so based on the results of this study that adds to this growing body of literature uh, surrounding gamification, specifically escape rooms in pharmacy education, future consideration should be given to teaching additional content in the realm of geriatric pharmacotherapy, as well as pharmacotherapeutics more broadly, or really any topic in pharmacy education using an escape room format or other form of gamification. Before I wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on this project. These are some students who worked with me in developing the activity and piloting the activity. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. What questions do you all have? Yeah. I don't have a question, but I think based on this, you will be taking over the beers criteria in our <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> the last time she volunteers, right? <laughs> yes. I, I might have missed this. this. First of all, this sounds amazingly fun in the classroom environment. Um, but I was curious, um, and if I missed this, I apologize, for the student groups did they get to select themselves or were these pre-planned ahead? So I did allow them to self-select into groups. Okay. So the students selected their groups and it was groups of three to four. But I did give the caveat because the, the class was um, comprised, it was mostly first year students, um, handful of second year students. I think there was one P3 or third year student. So I did give the caveat, you have to have only one P2 or P3 in your group ah. to make it seem a little bit more balanced. Okay. Other questions? Do you have your codes available to do this for other stuff? Like the Google slide and the Google Forms? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd be happy to. Why don't you put it in the public folder for all of us? <laughs> yeah, so... yeah, so the question was if I had um, this, the Google Forms and, and slides available to to share, I do have the templates if if anyone is interested in in adopting those for other activities. What other questions for Dr. Hart? Yes, correct. Thank you. That looked like a lot of fun. Maybe we should have done this conference this way. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was thinking about is, and maybe you didn't do it, but do you have any ideas about what made some groups more effective or um, to get out of the escape room sooner than other groups? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So the question is, do I have an idea of what made some groups more effective to get out of the escape room versus other groups? Um, so I mentioned earlier that I had the caveat that they, the students could only have one second year or third year student per group because the class was mostly first year. So I didn't want all the second years and third year students to be in their own group to kind of give an a, you know even distribution of different class years among the groups. Um, interestingly, the group that finished first was all uh, it was all first year students, and so that it didn't really I couldn't chalk it up to like level in school. It turns out that um, they had all done an escape room before, and one of the people in that group was very, very competitive. And so I think they, which I, I learned when I was talking to them afterwards, and I think uh, that might have been some of it was if they had done an escape room before, if they had experienced solving puzzles, like the puzzle I showed you that uh, about like the diphenhydramine and, you know, each letter associated with a number and needing to sum that to get the, the two digits, um, that type of question was the one that most students required a hint for. So I think students who had more interest in like solving puzzles and that sort of thing may have um, had an easier time with some of the clues. Great. We might have time for one more question. 
I'll ask a real one. Okay. Um, did you have the opportunity to look at how this compared to maybe like test scores? Um, if this was assessed on, a, you know, the beers was assessed on a test. So that's a great question. So the question was, did I have the opportunity to look at how this compared to test scores if the beer criteria was assessed on a test? So for that elective course, I did not have um, have tests as as part of it. So I wasn't able to do that. And because it was an anonymous survey, I didn't, um, I wouldn't have been able to to link it to the test scores. But that's definitely an interesting consideration to look at how performance in the activity and on like the pre and post assessment would compare to examination scores. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart. All right, in our final presentation today, I have the pleasure of introducing one of our PharmD candidate students, uh, Kevin Lee, who's graduating in June um, of this year. So he was awarded one of the Pline Scholarships in 2023, and he'll be sharing um, the results from that project with us today. So join me in welcoming Kevin Lee. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Winters, for the introduction. Um, like she said, my name is Kevin. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student here. I'm about to graduate in two months, which I'm really excited for. Um, but at the same time, you know, in uh, speaking with the last presentation, I am sad to miss out on the future escape rooms that are in the classroom. So very jealous of the future students being able to experience that. Um, but for today, um, I have the pleasure of uh, speaking um, about a project that I've worked uh, closely under Dr. Gray uh, for the last year or so. Um, and we were researching uh, this association between cumulative anticholinergic use and white matter hyperintensity burden. So by way of background, um, anticholinergic medications essentially are medications that block the action of acetylcholine uh, directly at the receptors. Um, so these acetylcholine or muscarinic receptors are present throughout the body. Um, they're in the brain. Acetylcholine is involved in cognition, learning, and memory. And in the rest of the body, uh, acetylcholine is involved in urination, intestinal movement, and muscle contractions, to name a few. On the right side, in, in the rest of the body, we've seen that um, certain medications have been specifically designed and developed to target these receptors to treat conditions like overactive bladder, uh, constipation, and muscle spasms. Um, but on the left side, we do see some medications that weren't intended to have these strong anticholinergic properties, um, but do so. And with that being said, they do have unintended side effects. So what exactly are these side effects? Centrally, uh, we see that these medications with strong anticholinergic properties result in impaired concentration, confusion, attention deficit, and memory impairment. Um, and peripherally, uh, we kind of learned that these medications dry the body up, uh, resulting in decreased salivation, decreased sweating, difficulty urinating, and decreased GI motility. So what's the problem here with these medications? Besides those medications that, these medications with uh, these unintended side effects, uh, we've also found, and several studies have demonstrated that uh, cumulative use of these medications result in increased dementia risk. Um, in particular, one study conducted here in the Seattle region has shown that high cumulative anticholinergic use has resulted in a 54% increased risk of dementia. Um, so while there is a growing body of evidence uh, showing the association between these two variables, uh, the biological mechanisms underlying this is unclear and is something that we're hoping to explore. So certain studies have uh, examined the association between cumulative uh, anticholinergic use and changes in brain structure. Um, so several studies, uh, and specifically six studies, have looked at the relationship uh, between anticholinergic medications, uh, as well as uh, in relationship with uh, factors such as brain volume, cortical thickness, and white matter tract integrity, with uh, overall these results showing um, very mixed signals. Um, out of the six studies, uh, four studies showed that an increase in anticholinergic burden resulted in a decrease in brain volume and cortical thickness, while the other two did not show any significant results there. And only one study looked into white matter integrity, which found no conclusive results there as well. 
Um, so no study has actually explored the possible biological effects of anticholinergic use on changes in white matter hyperintensities, uh, which simplistically uh, is uh, white spots that are seen in uh, brain MRI scans uh, that may be indicative of white matter lesions. And we've seen in the literature as well that I Alzheimer's is, is not only a gray matter disease, but may potentially be a mix of both gray and white matter association. So therefore, the, the objective of this study is to examine this association between uh, cumulative anticholinergic exposure and white matter hyperintensity burden. So how do we do this? Um, so with um, uh, to, to receive our cohort, uh, we use the Adult Change in Thought Study, uh, which is a prospective cohort study uh, within locally at Kaiser. And uh, with this study, um, they began recruiting um, back in 1995 and continuously have recruited about 10 to 15 individuals per month. Um, in this particular study, um, to be eligible, uh, you have to be over 65 years old, living in the community and without dementia. And with this particular analysis, we looked um, at individuals who had a 10 year of continuous enrollment um, at Kaiser, as well as sufficient enough quality um, scans available so that we're able to assess this white matter hyperintensity burden. And how did we measure our exposure? So uh, we wanted to see, you know, the cumulative effects of the anticholinergic medications over this full study period. And to do so, we use this measure or variable called total standardized daily dose. Um, so I think the best way to explain this measure is um, by going through an example, uh, which I have on the screen here. Uh, so let's say a participant has uh, medication fills in a 10 year period from 2003 to 2013. In 2010, they filled a prescription for 90 tablets of meclizine 25 milligrams, which was refilled once. Uh, so that means there were two fills of 90 tablets times 25 milligrams. And we divide that by the minimum effective dose of this particular medication, which is 25 milligrams, resulting in a standardized daily dose of 180. We did the same thing in 2011 with this individual filling a prescription for 60 tablets of oxybutynin, 10 milligrams, which was refilled five times, resulting in six fills of 60 tablets times 10 milligrams. But with this medication, the minimum effective dose is five milligrams. So we divided that by five, uh, resulting in 720 standardized daily dose. And to get the total, we would sum up the two resulting in a TSDD of 900. So for all of the individuals we included in this cohort, uh, we did this kind of exercise uh, to get the TSDD for each individual. So now we have our uh, understand our study cohort as well as our exposure. Um, so what did we measure exactly? So the primary outcomes we use to measure white matter hyperintensities include uh, these three scales, physicus, modified Shelton's, and age-related white matter changes. So in radiology, there has been attempts to uh, semi-quantitatively um, kind of analyze and assess this white matter hyperintensity burden. And uh, throughout the years, these three measures have kind of come up in an attempt to standardize uh, this process. And so these three were recommended by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, um, and were recommended to be used to measure the burden of white matter hyperintensities. Uh, this is uh, very complex and beyond the scope of pharmacy, uh, but there are, you know, various strengths and weaknesses between these three measures. Um, and ultimately, they do differ in, in the sense that uh, for the purpose of this presentation, the, the way they grade or divide the regions of the brain and the way they measure the white matter hyperintensities. Um, the scales are also different as well, with physicus being on a scale of 0 to 6, modified Shelton's zero to 30 and age related white matter changes, zero to 15. Um, but the bottom line is that all three of these uh, scales have shown important relationships to disease burden and dementia. And the higher the number means a higher burden. So moving on to our study uh, characteristics with our demographics here. Um, so we had a total of 1,043 participants uh, with a mean age of 81 years, mostly female, um, college educated and white. Um, we, if you see on the top row, uh, we divided our exposure categorically um, into five major categories ranging from no use 
to our highest anticholinergic exposure group having a greater or equal than 1,096 TSDD. Some demographic information that I wanted to highlight or differences specifically between the no use group and our highest anticholinergic exposure group is that in our highest anticholinergic exposure group, we do see that they are more likely to be female and have a BMI of greater than 30 and less likely to be college educated. Moving on to our comorbidities, uh, we do see a similar trend as well here between the no use and highest anticholinergic exposure group, where in that highest uh, anticholinergic exposure group, we do see they're more likely to have comorbidities such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, depression, insomnia, anxiety, and diabetes. In terms of our anticholinergic exposure, we looked at it two ways. On the left, uh, we first looked at it with participants as the unit of analysis. So what that means is that we see that the individuals in this cohort uh, took a number of medications um, in different classes, uh, ranging from antidepressants to antihistamines to bladder antimuscarinics. Uh, but what really contributed to the total standardized daily dose, as you can see on the right, is antidepressants with 65% of these medications contributing to the cumulative anticholinergic exposure. So now onto our outcomes. Um, here is um, a graph uh, representing our first outcome of the Physicus score. Um, so as a reminder, this is a scale of zero to six. And to orient, the y-axis uh, is split between our categories of our exposure from no use at the very bottom all the way to our highest anticholinergic exposure group of greater or equal than 1,096 TSDD. So with this, we did find a statistically significant difference uh, between the no use group and the highest anticholinergic exposure group uh, with about a difference of a 10% difference that we see here. Uh, interestingly, we also do see a difference between the no use group and the low anticholinergic exposure group of 1 to 90 TSDD, but we did not find any differences um, in the middle two exposure groups. A similar trend was seen here with our second white matter hyperintensity outcome with the modified Shelton scale. This scale is on a uh, scale of 0 to 30. And we see about a 7% difference between the no use group and the uh, highest anticholinergic exposure group. Again, we see a similar trend where the low anticholinergic exposure group, uh, we see a difference, but for the middle two groups, we don't see any difference there. And finally, for the age-related white matter changes, we see a difference of about 5% uh, between the no use and highest anticholinergic exposure group similar trend as the last two outcome measures. So ultimately with this study, uh, we found that the highest anticholinergic burden was associated with greater white matter uh, hyperintensity burden across all three of the neuroimaging outcomes of Physicus, modified Shelton's and age-related white matter changes. Uh, while we do know that you know, the lower the number is better in terms of the white matter hyperintensity burden, the clinical significance of these differences is unclear at the moment. Um, this is a novel study looking into biological mechanisms underlying the link between these two variables. Um, and prolonged use of anticholinergic medications in older adults may not be ideal for maintaining structural brain um, integrity. Um, but one thing to note as a limitation, this is a cross-sectional study. So um, no, no causality can be kind of determined and concluded uh, based on this study. And with that being said, in terms of future directions, results should be replicated in a more generalizable sample of individuals with scans conducted for research purposes and not because of an individual potentially needing a clinical reason to receive an MRI scan, which is uh, what these, this population uh, exhibited as well as um, a longitudinal analysis uh, showcasing perhaps changes in um, these white matter hyperintensity outcomes over time uh, would be something to look into in the future as well. So this study wouldn't be possible without uh, the collaboration with um, the Kaiser Biostatistics team, as well as UW Medicine's Department of Radiology. So definitely would like to acknowledge them here, as well as uh, my advisor, Dr. Gray, here.
And with that, I conclude my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. We've got our first question. So A, that talk was amazing. And this is amazing work. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I have a question about the white matter scans for patients with depression. So how much overlap are we seeing in the brain matter scans with depression and that driving some of the, some of the findings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so looking specifically at the scans themselves, um, I don't think we collected any data or we looked into kind of the analyses specifically for the subpopulation with depression. Uh, we do see here that overall out of the 1,043 uh, individuals in this cohort, about 33% of them did have depression, um, as well as with 23% with anxiety. Um, but that's something we did not look at for um, and was beyond the scope of this study. What other questions is that? Uh, thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, so I, I I don't really know anything about uh, white matter hyperintensity, and I was just wondering, is it so? It, what's the relationship between that and the the markers of AD neuropathology that uh, that we you know we've been talking about a lot today, like uh, amyloid plaques and tau uh, phosphorylation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, just based on the, uh, our initial literature review, we do see that there is some type of association and there's some type of signal that indicates that those uh, individuals with Alzheimer's disease do have increased white matter hyperintensities. Um, the main purpose um, was to kind of explore why that is. Uh, we aren't really sure in terms of how this is related to any of the biomarkers that were discussed earlier today, um, especially with um, the amyloid plaques as well. Um, but in terms of the neuroimaging outcomes, white matter has not really been really looked at uh, in the literature. Um, out of the six studies, it has mostly been just whether or not the brain has been shrinking um, or um, more so gray matter kind of uh, uh, in, this, in the newer imaging scans. Um, so that's something that's unclear right now in the literature. Other questions? All right. Thank you so much again, Kevin. All right. Um, so with that, I have the pleasure of being able to dismiss us all this evening. But before I do so, I just want to say thank you again to all of our presenters who are able to make it today. Thank you to everyone here in this room and those who joined us virtually as well um, for such an awesome day of uh, wonderful presentations and discussion. Um, with that, I'll dismiss us all just across the hall um, for a reception for those who are able to join us. So thank you.